Good afternoon to everyone on the East Coast. Uh, and good morning to those of you who are further west. My name is Steve Toich and as chair of this committee, I want to welcome everyone to the final session of the second meeting of the Committee on Health Effects uh, and Patterns of Use of Premium Cigars of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Um, as most of you know, the study is sponsored by the Center for Tobacco Products at the FDA, as well as the NIH. Uh, I'm joined today by committee members who are, like all of you, participating virtually. Uh, I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a moment, but before we do, I want to uh, note that this is a, an open, on-the-record session. Uh, interested individuals have been invited to attend as observers via Zoom. Uh, I'd like to also remind everyone that this is an information gathering session. Uh, the committee is in the process of assembling materials that it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone today to be uh, mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and it, that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here today thinking uh, otherwise. Uh, comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as a positions of the committee or the National Academies. Uh, in addition, committee members typically do ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. Um, we anticipate the report to be released in March of next year. Um, before then, the committee will be deliberating thoroughly as well as drafting its report. And once the draft is completed, it goes through a uh, rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee and then uh, through final revisions and, uh, and release. This is the third information gathering, se uh, gathering session of the committee and will include presentations and discussions on a variety of topics to fulfill the committee's information gathering needs. In addition to the presentations we hear, will hear today, the committee has reviewed information relevant to its charge and, when, and will continue to gather information over the course of the study. The date for the next information gathering meeting uh, is May 28, uh, and uh, the information about that meeting will be posted on the project website. Um, so today, um, uh, following speakers' comments, uh, we will have a Q question and answer period with the committee members. Um, if time allows, and I'm afraid, uh, I doubt that it actually will, but we will open the floor to questions from other meeting attendees. Um, but please know that only questions relevant to the committee statement of task or the draft research questions provided it, uh, to the committee by the sponsors will be uh, read aloud. For the record, uh, the speakers are asked to disclose whether they receive any funding for activities related to the topics being discussed today and sources of, uh, of such funding, such as uh, from a government agency, a foundation, or, uh, or industry. Uh, this meeting is being webcast live and being recorded. Uh, available speaker presentation slides and videos will be posted uh, one to two weeks after the meeting. Um, and before uh, we uh, uh, introduce the speakers, I'd like the committee members to briefly introduce themselves, giving their name and current affiliation. Brief bios of all the committee members are available online. Um, I'll start and then uh, we'll call on each committee member in alphabetical order to introduce themselves. So I'm Steve Toich, uh, I'm uh, at UCLA and USC. And let's start with uh, Wei. Hi, uh, I'm Wei Bao, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Iowa. Neil? I'm Neil Benowitz, um, Emeritus Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology at the University of California, San Francisco. And Chris? Dean Del Nevo, uh, Professor at Rutgers University. And Pebbles? Pebbles Fagan, professor at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Maché? Uh, Maché Donievich, professor of oncology at Russell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. And Steve Hecht? Steve Hecht, I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. Miranda? 
I'm Miranda Jones. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Grace? Hello, my name is Grace Kong. I'm assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine. Adam? Hi, Adam Leventhal, professor of preventive medicine, University of Southern California. And Darren? I'm Darren Mays. I'm an associate professor at The Ohio State University. And Raphael? Hi, my name is Raphael Mesa. I'm associate professor and associate chair of the University of Michigan. And Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Sterling. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas School of Public Health. And uh, lastly, but uh, certainly not last in our minds, Andrea. <laughs> Andrea Volanti, Associate Professor at the University of Vermont. Great, thanks to all of you. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our first panel, which will focus on tobacco science. We'll be hearing first from uh, uh, Dr. David Ashley, who is Research Professor at Georgia State University School of Public Health. And then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Michael Cummings, who's a professor at uh, the Medical University of uh, South Carolina. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ashley and Dr. Cummings will each both present, and then we'll open it up, to, as I mentioned, to Q&A with the committee. So uh, Dr. Ashley, please feel free to begin when you're ready. We look forward to what you have to tell us. All right, great. Well, I'm going to share my slides. And hopefully everybody can see that. That is my hope. Um, we can see it. So um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. I'm very glad to, it, to do that. Um, and now if I can just make sure I'm getting them to move. All right, so these are my disclosures. Um, I did spend uh, seven years at the FDA in the Center for Tobacco Products, but make sure very clear, I do not speak for FDA and anything that I say about FDA is clearly um, going to be dependent on having been gone from there for four years. And so um, I just want to make sure that's very clear. Um, the committee asked me to kind of address three questions. And those are, why are there questions about premium cigars? How are premium cigars defined? And how does scientific research inform FDA tobacco regulation? And I'm going to run through some slides pretty quick to try to uh, allow there to be as much time as possible for questions at the end. So on April 25th, 2014, FDA um, put out the uh, uh, proposed deeming rule, a um, NPRM on the proposed deeming rule. And in that they proposed two options. Option one was that all products meeting the definition of a tobacco product except accessories of newly deemed tobacco products would be deemed. And then there was a second option that excluded premium cigars. And so that was in the NPRM for the deeming rule. May 10th, 2016, the deeming rule came out and was, was made law. And in that final deeming rule, FDA made a couple of things, said a couple of things. And I pulled this out of that. It says, the available evidence does not provide a basis for FDA to conclude that the patterns of premium cigar use sufficiently reduce the health risk to warrant exclusion. And then it says there's no appropriate public health justification, justification to exclude premium cigars. So FDA chose option one and included premium cigars as part of the deeming rule. On August 19th of last year, in a lawsuit by the Cigar Association of America versus FDA, Judge Meadow ruled and enjoined the enforcement of the pre-market review requirements against premium cigars. And he, um, he remanded the final deeming rule for the limited purpose of considering whether a streamlined substantial equivalence process is appropriate for, for premium cigars. And from what I understand from this, this is the issue that's really before FDA right now, how to deal with a streamlined substantial equivalence process for premium cigars, which the judge ruled um, could not be uh, prevented FDA from enforcing pre-market review requirements against premium cigars. So I believe that is the primary issue that is before FDA that needs to be addressed. The second thing that was asked about was definitions of premium cigars. And in the NPRM, that, again, that was issued on April 25th, 2014, um, FDA proposed a definition for premium cigars. And it was at eight points. 
Five of those points that are in black are carried over in just about every definition you will see on premium cigars. And that's including is wrapped in whole tobacco leaf, contains 100% leaf tobacco binder, has no filter tip or non-tobacco mouthpiece, doesn't have a characterizing flavor other than tobacco and weighs more than six pounds per thousand units. There are a couple of other aspects of that. The two that are in green, which are containing primarily long filler tobacco and is made by combining manually the wrapper filler and binder in some form or other it seems to be carried over to other definitions also. So even though the wording might be different, the concept there is the same. And then there was a, a, an eighth um, um, part of this, which had to do with retail price. And that, that's in red. And that part in red doesn't seem to be in many of the following definitions of what FDA felt like was a premium cigar. March 26, 2018, FDA put out an advanced notice of proposed real rulemaking on the regulation of premium cigars, and they asked for data on a whole group of characteristics of premium cigars, which they might use to help them define and regulate premium cigars. And in red there, I've marked some things that are a little odd. They're a little out of um, the normal definition, and those include fermentation type, whether tobacco used for premium cigar filler is grown, the rate of production, nicotine content, tar delivery amounts, carbon monoxide delivery, frequency with which price changes are initiated by particular levels in the distribution chain, and the packaging quantity and size. And those do not seem to be uh, evident in most other definitions. August 19th, 2020, FDA put out a new definition of a premium cigar. And again, those five things I talked about before are still there. The two that are in green are still there. They're just reworded a little bit. And then in place of the, the red aspect related to um, price, they now have a, an aspect which is contains only tobacco, water, and vegetable gum with no other ingredients or additives. And so this appears to be the most recent definition that FDA has put out around a premium cigar. And so my suggestion would be to go with this as the definition, the working definition that you're dealing with. Obviously, the committee will have to make their own decision, but this seems to be the latest definition of premium cigar that FDA has used. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about science and regulatory actions. And first, let me talk about pre-market review. So pre-market review includes investigational tobacco products, new product review, substantial equivalents, exemptions from substantial equivalents, and modified risk tobacco products. And I need to go back. And I highlighted substantial equivalence because if you remember before, that was the thing that the judge identified as an issue FDA was gonna to have to deal with. Important thing about product review is the applicant must provide adequate evidence for FDA to make a finding. So the evidentiary burden is on the applicant, the scientific research to evaluate the evidence provided by the applicant. So that burden is on the applicant for FDA to make those decisions. Behind all of the Tobacco Control Act is the population health standard. And you'll see it in slightly different forms, but usually it's using the words appropriate for the detection of public health. And it talks about the risks and benefits to the population as a whole, increased or decreased cessation and increased or decreased initiation of products. It's not the same as safety and efficacy standard used by most of the rest of FDA, but is a new population health standard. And when you begin looking at statutory questions related to product review, you see that, that wording built into those. So for a new product review, the question is, is the marketing of a new product appropriate for the protection of public health? So you see that wording in there directly. For substantial equivalence, you see the differences between a new product and a predicate product raise different questions of public health. Again, that same language. And then for a modified risk tobacco product, Will the product as it is actually used by consumers significantly reduce the harm and risk of tobacco related disease to individual tobacco users and benefit the health of the population as a whole? So that population health standard is baked into all product review decisions. Now, when FDA goes through making product authorization, product review decisions, there are a lot of aspects that go into making those decisions. And one of the first things they look at are different groups in the population. And so they're gonna look at users of the new product. They're gonna look at current smokers. 
They're going to look at poly users, users of more than one product. They're going to look at the effect on adult non-users, and they're going to look at the effect on youth and adolescents. And each of those groups are of interest to FDA and the impact of those decisions on those groups. And as far as what that impact might be, they're concerned about relative risk. They're concerned about whether pro people will switch completely, whether there'll be complete cessation, whether there'll be polyuse or initiation. So the impact of, of the, the decision on these use behaviors of these different groups is really what FDA uses in making those um, uh, product review decisions. I'll get back to a little bit more detail on this in just a minute. But first I wanna talk about product standards just briefly. And so product standards are built into section 907 of the act and are very broad. But the biggest thing about that is in this case, the evidentiary burden for product standards rests on FDA. FDA must develop the science. And again, those um, product standards can apply very broadly. There are a lot of things it can apply to. Um, I'll let you guys read that. I'm not gonna go into them and read it for you. There are two things that can that limit product standards, and that is the banning of all cigarettes, all smokeless, all little cigars, all cigars other than little cigars, all pipe tobacco or all roll your own, and also requiring the reduction of nicotine yields of a tobacco product to zero. So tobacco product standards are limited, but limited only in these ways. When FDA develops product standards, they need to have a legally defensible rationale and then be able to enforce the standard by asking the question, does a specific marketed product meet the standard? And to determine whether a standard is appropriate, FDA needs to answer a series of questions. And so those questions are, is the standard justifiable? In other words, is there adequate evidence? Is it necessary? Is this the least costly alternative to achieve the goal? Is it appropriate? Will it do what it claims to do? Is it unambiguous? Is the requirement clear? Is it measurable? Are there methods to measure the standard and then quantifiable? Can the methods distinguish products that meet the standard from products that do not meet the standard? And so as FDA is formulating product standards, they look at these issues to make sure they've got the evidence to support that. In both regulation and, re and review scientific considerations, what FDA is really interested in is the impact on morbidity and mortality. And FDA would love to have data on morbidity and mortality, but they virtually never get real data on morbidity and mortality. What they get instead is information on materials, ingredients, design, composition, constituents, other features in marketing. And then somehow they have to link that information with a public health, the likelihood of public health impact. And the way they link that is through science, through scientific research that's done. And that, that linking that information to public health goes through scientific issues around appeal, addictiveness, use behavior, exposure, pharmacokinetics, toxicity, perception, initiation, and cessation. And then FDA uses the science around, around these issues around the product to connect the information to public health. And that's how FDA goes about their process of evaluating both product standards and product review. And I'll be glad to answer questions when uh, that time comes. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dr. Cummings, over to you. So Dr. Cummings, you would like me to share share and advance your slides, is that correct? Yeah, that, okay. I, was, I wasn't trusting myself to do it, so. Not a problem, give me one moment. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, can you see those? Yeah, and if you just go to the next uh, slide, you'll get my disclosure uh, as well. So I uh, work at the Medical University of South Carolina where I'm a professor uh, and lead the tobacco uh, uh, research program here. I have NIH grant funding and contracts. Uh, I've spent about 25 years doing litigation against cigarette companies in over 200 cases. Uh, and then I get uh, other resources, financial resources, because I'm a consultant on a bunch of uh, other tobacco related, as well as just general cancer grants uh, around the United States, just listing uh, some of my uh, uh, consulting there. So if you go to the next slide, 
And uh, I'm going to go qu quickly through these next series because I think Dave has really just uh, captured this. But uh, I was uh, one of I was fortunate to be one of the uh, co-editors along with uh, Dave Burns and Dietrich Hoffman of the uh, NCI monograph uh, in 1996 that was done on uh, cigars. Uh, and you know, you know, basically a cigar differentiated from a cigarette is, uh, you know, tobacco that's uh, uh, wrapped in, uh, in tobacco rather than wrapped in paper. Uh, and then there are different types of cigars, uh, mainly based on size and cost. And for taxation purposes, you have the small cigars uh, based on uh, how much they weigh and so on. So this was the definition that was in the monograph back in 1996. If you go to the next slide, this is just showing you pictures. This is actually out of a paper I think uh, Cliff Watson uh, did, uh, uh, which I found interesting, just comparing the different types of cigars from larger ones to you know, ones that look in uh, like cigarettes. And then of course, cigarettes, if you go to the next slide, uh, this just gives you real quickly a range of uh, nicotine and pH, which I'll talk about a little bit later because uh, uh, both those factors influence, uh, you know, how often people will use a product, obviously nicotine dependence, and then pH uh, has some effects on inhalation of smoke, which uh, facilitates delivery of nicotine into the airways. But you can see uh, uh, you know, the, the differences between the large cigarettes. Uh, obviously you get more stuff because you just have a bigger product. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so, you know, Dave touched on this uh, to some extent. If you just go to uh, the internet and get a definition of a premium cigar, uh, it's based on cost and whether it's hand rolled or not. So uh, premium cigars mean cigars which are made entirely by hand of all natural tobacco leaf, hand constructed and hand wrapped, wholesaling uh, typically of $2 or more and weighing more than three pounds per uh, 1,000 cigarettes. To go to the next slide, I think Dave uh, highlighted this. This is just the, the most recent definition uh, that's come about with regards to premium cigars. And then if you start looking at the sales data, uh, it looks like premium cigar use is doing very well in terms of sales. You can see imports of premium cigars there uh, that's gone up since 2014. If you go to the next slide, and of course, uh, the marketing of premium cigars is, uh, you know, uh, uh, out there. You have Cigar Aficionado, you have ratings of different cigars, uh, the hottest cigarette brands, and so on. Uh, there are even uh, podcasts or radio shows that uh, talk about premium cigars. If you go to the next slide. Uh, this is this is one uh, from a fellow actually from Western New York, uh, who I had some dealings with uh, about 20 five years ago when their monograph came out, he wasn't too happy with it, uh, Cigar Dave, but uh, uh, there's a whole show that's you know dedicated to talking about uh, uh, premium cigars, not uh, non-premium cigars. So if you go to the next slide. So the monograph, this is just the cover, next slide, and I'm just gonna give you some of the, the highlights. Of course, we struggle because definitions are out there and the definitions influence the epidemiology, what you get to count and then look at as you relate it to uh, you know, toxicity or chemistry that might be done. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, ultimately in terms of health risks. So if you go to the next slide, just go through real quickly here some of the differences. Cigars consist uh, of filler, binder, and wrapper, and all are air cured and fermented. Uh, and you know, there's just a range of different cigars and what they are made up of. Um, and you know, typically, as Dave pointed out, with a premium cigar, it's hand rolled and wrapped in natural tobacco, where and so you're not having a manufacturing component to a premium cigar where all other cigars are, uh, you know, essentially machine made, uh, typically using paper that's dipped in tobacco extract. If you go to the next slide. And this, you know, again, from the, the monograph where, uh, we go back real quick, you just see a real quick difference between, you know, different types of cigarettes, the Swisher, sweet little cigars, 
uh, a large cigar and then a premium cigar. And you can see obviously the big difference the, is the weight. The more tobacco you have, the more weight, the more puffs you can get off of the product, the more total volume of, of smoke and uh, higher levels of tar, as I usually describe it, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the smoke from a cigar is like the smoke from a log versus a cigarette, which is the smoke that comes from a twig. Uh, and uh, similar kinds of things when you look at it in terms of uh, benzoapyrene or various uh, tobacco specific nitrosamines that you'll see. Go to the next slide. Uh, the pH of uh, cigars differs uh, and, and cigarettes uh, differ quite a bit. pH of a, a cigarette tends to be at about five and a half to six typically. Uh, you know, here's a, from a study from a long time ago, looking at different kinds of cigars, little cigars, as well as the larger cigars and cigarettes. And you get variations, uh, particularly puff to puff. Uh, and if you average it overall, you'll, you'll get some differences. But if you go to the next slide, this is actually from uh, an internal Reynolds documents where they looked at the smoke of uh, cigarettes, pH, uh, and uh, effect on uh, smoking behavior. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is from there, from this document. On the next slide, you'll see uh, here that uh, when they were talking about a cigarette, a cigarette is a system for delivery of nicotine to the smoker. Uh, at normal pH at or uh, below about six, essentially all the uh, smoke nicotine is chemically combined with acidic substances uh, and is non-volatile and relatively slowly absorbed uh, by the smoker. And as you move up uh, the pH scale to a more alkaline smoke, you'll get uh, above six and that increases the amount of nicotine in free form. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, a free, free form or free nicotine is more readily absorbed in the mouth. Uh, and so uh, of course Reynolds at the time was looking at additives and things they could do to modify pH to boost up uh, the amount of uh, the pH of the smoke uh, to slightly increase its uh, ability to get into the airways more rapidly absorbed. But what they point out here is uh, cigar smoke, and I believe this is cigar smoke predominantly from your larger premium cigars tend to have a pH above eight. And above eight, it tends to be uh, hard to inhale the smoke uh, directly into the airway. So uh, if you go to the next slide, that has important implications for uh, repeated use of a product because if you don't get nicotine rapidly absorbed into the lungs uh, where it uh, gets into the body, hits the brain, it's highly addictive. Uh, uh, perhaps one of the reasons you see differences in patterns of use of premium cigars is not only their cost, which would be a disincentive to regular use, but also uh, the high pH uh, lowers the potential for addiction. Uh, if you can look at uh, cigarette prevalence and patterns of use, I'll, I'll just go through a few slides there. This next slide. Uh, this is just showing you historically, uh, cigars uh, used to be uh, fairly predominant <laughs> in the United States around the turn of the 20th century. It was cigars and chewing tobacco and snuff. Cigarettes really didn't exist. Uh, they really uh, changed the market though with the introduction of the modern cigarette and the other forms of tobacco dropped off dramatically. That began to change, however, uh, in the early 90s. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is looking at uh, small and large cigars. They don't break out the premium group and then total cigar consumption, but you could see how it was relatively low and started to make a, a little bit of an increase. The small cigars, particularly around uh, labeling of uh, the warning labels that went on cigarettes, uh, there was an exclusion for small cigars for a period of time, and they became popular as substitutes for cigarettes. And then the uh, the, the the labeling was changed, and then uh, and the marketing uh, that restricted uh, the marketing of small cigars. And then, uh, but total cons you know consumption uh, pretty much uh, uh, was declining until the early uh, uh, '90s, and then has made a comeback. If you go to the next slide. 
And uh, this is just showing you differences. It's predominantly among males, at least that was true up into the early uh, 1990s. If you go to the next slide. So it's primarily seen among males, not females. This is uh, probably the best data that I've seen as I was searching for information on uh, premium cigar use or cigar use differences. If you go to the next slide, this is from the uh, FDA PATH study. And it's looking at uh, here, premium, non-premium cigar cigarillos, filtered uh, cigars and cigarettes. You can look at the overall prevalence. Uh, so premium cigar use is a much lower prevalence, uh, less than 1%. You can see 95, close to 96% male. Uh, it's predominantly, although not exclusively, uh, seen more uh, among whites uh, and particularly compared to other types of cigars. Uh, and uh, when you look at income, uh, you know, premium cigar use, not surprisingly, is uh, seen more prominently in those uh, uh, with higher incomes, household uh, incomes, uh, lower levels of poverty. Uh, and, uh, you know, more common actually in those with college and uh, some college or uh, completed college in contrast to the other products. If you go to the next slide. And then when you look at, uh, you know, years of a lifetime cigars smoked and so on, uh, and uh, now smoking and days smoked uh, per, you know, past 30 days, the use patterns are, are lower. Uh, for premium cigars than they are for uh, the other types of cigars and cigarettes. If you go to the next slide. And, and a higher use, by the way, I would say uh, for those who were uh, never uh, cigarette smokers. So uh, when we looked at this uh, smoking patterns as it related to health risks, uh, back in 1996, uh, we, you know, had to take into account, you know, duration of use and the types of uh, cigar use in the different surveys. They don't, uh, like NHIS, doesn't really distinguish between the types of cigar use, and which is why PATH is unique. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So it made it a, a little harder to look at. And also you get different uh, patterns of use. You get current users, you get current mixed cigar and cigarette users. You have current secondary cigar users. That's uh, defined as a group that was, uh, you know, originally smoking cigarettes that went to cigars. And then you've got the dual users or concurrent users of both products. And you have to take that into account. And again, these data uh, were from 1996. So when you look at the epidemiology, we were looking at uh, some of the large epidemiology studies that had measured cigar use, uh, the current population surveys one and two. If you go to the next slide, and again, restricted to male smokers. So uh, we look at primary cigar users. Those are people who uh, smoked only cigars who never smoked cigarettes or a pipe. Uh, so that would be, you know, sort of the exclusive group. And then you've got the secondary cigar users who may have started out on, on cigarettes and then switched to cigars or vice versa. And then you've got the dual users. If you go to the next slide. And this is just showing you, uh, you know, uh, level of inhalation. Again, uh, just picked out one of the studies from the monograph, but, uh, uh, you know, basically you're seeing a, a much higher, uh, lower level of inhalation of uh, cigars, so primary cigars, uh, compared to secondary cigar users or cigarette only uh, folks, uh, cigarette smokers inhale. Secondary cigar users, once they, they used to smoke cigarettes, now they just use cigars. Uh, they were sort of in between. And the cigar only group uh, had the highest group that had the non-inhale uh, group. So if you go to the next slide, this relates to the health effects as you're gonna see, if you go to the next slide. Uh, and this is just summarizing some of the epidemiology that was contained in the monograph. And uh, it's uh, you know, directly related to how uh, frequently people uh, use cigars, how many cigars they use on a regular basis, as well as how they inhale them. Uh, and you can see, you know, cigars tend to be, you know, obviously higher than they are for never smokers. Uh, it's a little higher for the mixed group. 
of cigar and cigarette users, and then the highest for the cigarette group. To go to the next slide. And that's fairly consistent. This is just another way of uh, looking at it, uh, adjusting for age. So or you can look at it over at the combined group. So for primary cigar use, obviously there's an increase in risk uh, that's dose dependent based on the number uh, used per day. Uh, it's similar for secondary cigar. And remember the secondary cigar group, you know, that you begin to carry over your inhalation pattern to some extent. So it increases at a higher rate. The combined cigar cigarette users are high, uh, very similar to the cigarette only group. If you go to the next slide. So I'm just, you know, giving you a real quick overview. If you go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, there's a, a systematic review of this. Uh, very nice that I found recently uh, that was put together by uh, folks at the FDA actually. And you know, their summary is pretty much uh, what we found back in 1996 is cigars carry the same risk as cigarettes if they're used the same. So if you carry the same pattern of use of cigarettes over to cigars, you're essentially gonna see the same risk. Go to the next slide. So regulation of cigars, I just thought I'd touch on this. So we looked at it back in 1996. Uh, it's changed to some extent, obviously, but if you I'll give you a quick uh, summary of this, if you go to the next slide, we'll go through it real quickly. Uh, there are federal uh, laws uh, regarding uh, labeling of tobacco products. They're di they've been different uh, for different products, cigarettes and smokeless versus cigars uh, and uh, you know, the advertising restrictions on cigars, uh, little cigars really didn't come into the mid seventies, which explained the blip up in little cigar use that occurred there that I showed you previously. Uh, the taxation of the products are different. Um, if you go to the next slide. So uh, there are you know, labeling requirements. They're uh, in California and, and many of the manufacturers follow the requirements uh, in California. Uh, there are differences by state. And again, this is 1996 uh, data here. So obviously would have to be updated, uh, but there are some uh, differences. Most of the regulation of cigars has been, if it's done at all, has been done at the uh, state level. If you go to the next slide. And most of it, the difference has been related to tax. And so uh, cigarettes are taxed at usually at a higher rate than cigars and premium cigars probably at the lowest on a per a weight basis uh, when you look at it uh, overall. If you go to the next slide. And there's a lot of variation across states. Uh, and that's again, data that we looked at in 1996, if you go to the next slide, there are a lot of states, a lot of variation you're going to see, but uh, you see it's pretty complicated. Go to, go to the next slide. FTC has announced, uh, you know, its settlement requiring disclosure of SCAR health risks. Uh, and that, I think uh, David alluded to that a little bit. If you go to the next slide, this is in 2000 with FTC uh, and uh, just to, uh, under this agreement, what the warnings would uh, be on cigar products uh, sold in the US uh, under an FTC agreement from 2000. Next slide. So some basic conclusions, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, some in the cigar trade have made the claim that, uh, you know, cigar experience, cigar smokers experience little or no increased disease risk. This claim is not really supported by the available scientific evidence. Uh, you know, essentially uh, what we concluded, I think is still true today. You know, uh, the risks of tobacco smoke exposure are similar for all sources of uh, smoke tobacco and the magnitude of risks experienced uh, basically is proportionate to the intensity, the frequency of use and, and, it, and also to the inhalation. Uh, so basically the intensity of exposure, which may differ uh, by cigar types, as I pointed out. Go to the next slide. 
Uh, and this is just pointing out a pH is a big factor in inhalation of the smoke. So premium smokers and primary cigar smokers tend to be less likely to report inhalation. Uh, and if they report uh, less, if they report not inhaling the smoke, they're less likely to be using uh, the cigars on a frequent basis. And those two factors combine to increase risk. Go to the next slide. Regular cigar smokers who have never smoked, uh, who are, uh, uh, you know, and ever, and those who do not inhale experience significantly. Uh, I, uh, let me just pull this up because I'm being blocked here and seeing the full statement. Regular cigar smokers who have uh, never uh, smoked cigarettes, even those who do not inhale, do experience a significantly elevated risk. Uh, for cancers of the oral cavity, essentially, and the esophagus. Uh, so they hold the smoke in the mouth, so it's not just inhalation. Uh, another reason for a difference in risk between cigarettes and cigars is the differences in frequency of the two products used. Most cigarette smokers smoke every day. In contrast, as many as three quarters of cigar smokers only occasionally and some may only smoke a few cigars per year, the difference in frequency of exposure translates into lower risk. Go to the next slide. Uh, what we concluded in 1996 is we don't really know the, uh, the risk of addiction posed by cigar smoking. I think that's particularly true for uh, premium cigars or aren't uh, very good studies. I think if you smoke them like cigarettes, they're going to be addictive like cigarettes, but the difference in smoking patterns suggests a potential difference in addictive pro properties between uh, cigarettes and, and cigars. And uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, of special concern are the risks of those individuals who are mixed smokers. They were current smokers of both cigars and cigarettes, or who switched to smoking cigars from smoking cigarettes. A sizable fraction of today's cigar smokers are current or past cigarette smokers. These individuals are much more likely to continue to inhale when they switch to smoking cigars and therefore they may uh, remain at a much higher risk just like a cigarette smoker compared to somebody who's never smoked. Go to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to comment a little bit. The cigar market is very uh, volatile. <laughs> if you go to the next slide, I was just pulling up uh, recent uh, data. Um, and if, uh, this will be my last slide, just on mergers and acquisition. There's a lot of action in the market. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see just some of the things summarized here. John Middleton cigars purchased by Altria in 2007. Uh, you had uh, other purchases and so on going on in 2008. Altus uh, purchased Imperial uh, Tobacco Group uh, in 2019. ITG announced it was selling off its premium. Uh, it's uh, you know, selling of its uh, 2.6 billion interest in premium cigars. I guess somebody from ITG will be here to speak. So uh, perhaps they can they can. Uh, tell us more about what's going on in the market. But it's a very volatile marketplace with lots of different companies and, and lots of mergers and acquisitions going on. That was really the point of this slide. So that's all I have to be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, well, thank you uh, to both of you. And uh, uh, we'll now move to the Q&A with the committee. Um, so please raise your hands and, uh, and if you have a question, um, and either the Academy staff or I will call on you. Uh, let's start with Neil. So thank you for, for those presentations, David, uh, David and Mike, they, they were very helpful to us. Um, my question I think is more, is more for David. Um, addressing the substantial equivalence, the question is uh, how do you tell a new product? We've heard that cigar products, these premium cigars, are really uh, manufactured sort of like wine is. So you pick different parts of the leaf, you pick different uh, aging phenomena, and you sort of blend it together and you find something that tastes good, and then you market it with a certain brand name. Um, but certainly the cigars could differ quite a bit with the same brand name. Um, and 
when you're importing huge amounts of cigars from Nicaragua, uh, how do you know uh, what's a new product? Um, you know, it seems it's a much more complicated question than it would be for cigarettes. So any thoughts, David? So, so you really asked two questions, Neil. Um, one of them is basically about um, the fact that tobacco this year is not the same as tobacco next year. And so things do change. That happens with cigarettes too. And what the companies that when we interacted with them, FDA, one of the, co one of the things the companies try to do very hard is keep their product as much the same as possible. Because if you're buying a particular brand of a cigar or a cigarette, and you go back to buy another one, you really wanted it to taste the same. So the companies work very hard to blend the tobacco so that it tastes as close as possible. That's definitely true with cigarettes where they take multiple years of tobacco and blend that together. They've got to do that also with cigars. I'm less familiar with the cigar market and how they do it, but having dramatically different products each time a consumer buys it is gonna drive a, drive a consumer nuts. So when you get folks from the, the cigar industry, ask them that question also. Um, so the, then the next question that's included in that is also, how does FDA know it's a new product? And companies do have a particular formulation. They've got a particular way they do the products. And so FDA looks at that. And when they begin to change the way they make the product, so they change the amount of tobacco, they change the additives, they change any of the characteristics, then that makes it a new product. It is a little frustrating um, for FDA when the courts have decided that you can call something by a new name. And as long as the characteristics are the same, that does not make it a new product. So a new name doesn't make a product a new product. It actually is the formulation and what the characteristics are that make it a new product. Thanks. Um, I have Adam and then Steve and my Mache. Adam? Thanks. Thank you for the really informative presentations. Um, so this question could go for both of you, but particularly Dr. Cummings. Um, you, uh, you presented some interesting data about self-reported inhalation across the different um, tobacco user types. Are you aware of any research that has objectively looked at whether uh, cigar smokers and premium cigar smokers actually have deposition um, in the airways that confirms uh, inhaling or not inhaling or the degree of inhalation? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question uh, because as we know with cigarettes, uh, self-reported inhalation is not necessarily a very good indicator of what you would get if you did uh, you know, actual topography. Uh, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at premium cigars, inhalation, topography. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't exist. I'm just not aware of any. Um, Steve? Uh, David and uh, Mike, thank you very much for these uh, presentations. Very, very informative and helpful to the group. Uh, my basic question is uh, to both of you, is there any reason to believe that the health effects of a uh, premium cigar would be any different from those of uh, regular cigars of other cigars? Okay, let me, let, me, let me start and then Mike, you can jump in a little bit. So when FDA put out the deeming rule, and they asked specifically for that kind of data. That is the data we're looking for because FDA really, every <clears throat> premium cigars may need to be exempted, but no one provided that data and no one could find that data. So from what I understand, that data specifically, a robust amount of that data doesn't exist. I think there are reasons that it might be possible that premium cigars do not um, they're, they're, there's not as much risk from use of premium cigars. And that includes the fact that generally people don't smoke premium cigars as heavily, you know, as often as they smoke cigarettes or even little cigars. And for the people that don't inhale, they likely have lower health effects. That doesn't mean they have no health effects, but they're likely to be lower. Mike, I'll let you jump in. No, I, I would concur with what you just stated, David. I think that's the, uh, they're, they're Theoretically, I think there's a likelihood that they could be lower risk uh, because of uh, 
lower intensity of exposure to the constituents in the smoke, but uh, I've not seen an epidemiologic study looking at tracking the health outcomes of premium cigar smokers. I don't think it would be likely that it would be zero risk, uh, you know, compared to non-users, but compared to users of other uh, manufactured cigars uh, and cigarettes, I would think their risk might be lower theoretically, but I've not seen that evidence. Maje, your hand was up, now down. I didn't know if you still had a question. I was going to ask the same question what Adam did, so. All right, great mind. <laughs> <laughs> Rafael. Yeah, thank you. Maybe as a follow-up, and I just wonder if, um, so based in the data in the monograph, if there are studies or time periods where we could think that that information is more specific to premium cigars or more traditional cigars versus maybe other times where the data might be uh, more related to, to manufacture uh, and other types. So, so is, is, do you think there might be a way of getting at, at understanding potential differences uh, by when those studies were done and what type of cigar use they were capturing? Well, almost, I, I would just say most of the uh, large epidemiologic studies where cigar use was captured, uh, like the current population uh, surveys done by the American Cancer Society and, and similar studies, which were mainly on cigarettes, but then they captured other forms of tobacco. They didn't distinguish the types of cigars. And that's one of the problems, uh, even our you know, prevalence data like the National Health Examination Survey, uh, it asks about whether you've, you know, smoked more than 50 cigars in your lifetime, basically to count you as a cigar user, but they don't distinguish the type of cigars. Uh, the data from PATH uh, is beginning to look at this and distinguish, uh, you know, premium cigar use versus other types of cigars and cigarettes. Uh, I'm not seeing any data, and maybe David is aware of it or others on the panel, uh, looking at biomarkers, uh, which were collected in PATH at, at baseline and in some of the follow-up studies, and whether they've looked at biomarkers in premium cigar users versus other cigar users, uh, that would be informative and might, might get to the question of ventilation um, that was asked earlier by Adam. Yeah, I, I agree with, with, with Mike, what Mike just said. Most of those studies were not done distinguishing premium cigars from other cigar use or, or cigarette. You know. So it's, it's a tough question. And again, when FDA asked the question, nobody provided that data. PATH may be the best source of that at this point, but I've not seen anything that's jumped out at me. Ashe, you're back. Yes, I'm back. I actually have a question to David. Um, David, is it possible or is it is it um i don't know if you can answer that is it possible that fda actually may have done some study or through contract or internally that might be useful for the committee that we can somehow ask for or request on the premium cigars specifically or those data maybe are not publicly available or simply there is no access to those type of data so, so you can ask FDA and FDA, I'm sure FDA would be willing to share what they have. But the, the, tr the, the fact about how FDA does regulation, FDA doesn't do regulation or make product decisions based on data that they are hiding. Um, they, they can't do that, that's illegal. Um, all of their decisions have to be on data that's been made public. And so FDA's mindset is they will make data public as quickly as possible. And I've seen, in the midst of rulemaking, that a study getting done or getting you know most of the way done, and them realizing we've got one week to get this data out and get it published because so FDA is working as fast as they can to get as much data out as they can because they can't make decisions on data that's not been made public. So I would not expect FDA's got a bunch of stuff that they're hiding in the drawer um, because that does not meet their uh, needs. Neil. 
Um, so a follow-up question for David and a new question for David. Um, the follow-up was about the imports. So Mike said there were 330 million, I don't know, cigars or pounds or something per year coming from abroad. So a large percentage of products are coming from abroad. You said FDA basically regulates by looking at how the products are manufactured. How do they do that when there are multiple products coming from Central America? Um, I'm not specifically sure how they would do that about that particular issue. Um, it is not unusual for FDA to send folks down and walk through the factories. Um, and when uh, you know FDA does that related to e-cigarettes, they do that related to lots of things. So. Obviously, under pandemic rules, that's probably a different issue. But under normal circumstances, um, it is not. If, if it's a new product, they will go in and actually do an inspection of the factory to see what's going on. They will look at records. They will look at what the standards are. So they will walk through that factory and look at all the records that the, that the factory is that to make sure that the fact that the company can produce a consistent product. If the factory cannot cons make a consistent product, that can be grounds for denying marketing. Great, thanks. And the, the, the second question is, I know that I, you know, the CDC and the top reg and whatnot, you've thought a lot about machine testing paradigms. I'm just curious what your opinion is about what the appropriate machine testing is for premium cigar. We've heard before that, that people not uncommonly take 90 minutes to puff one of these. Um, how would you test a premium cigar? What do you think is the most valid machine testing approach? A lot of it depends on what you're trying to compare it to. So if you're, if you're trying to get some feel for what the normal exposure of people would be, you're going to need to try to, to smoke it the way it's uh, people, you know, as close as you can to the, how people would do it, over a range. Obviously, just like we do with cigarettes, we do uh, cigarettes under a light smoking regimen and then done an intense smoking regimen to try to get a range of exposures. And so that's what you would do. You run into a real problem with cigars, particular premium cigars on the smoking machine because they're not so consistent. And so trying to get a good seal on a cigar is not, try, not like getting a good seal on a cigarette that are made exactly the same. Because those cigars, their diameter will vary just a little bit and trying to get a good seal is critical. And so the whole science around getting a good machine measured level on a premium cigar is not trivial at all. It is a, a very challenging thing. Thank you. So we're at the uh, end of our time. Uh, Chris, since you didn't ask any questions, why don't I give you the last word for a quick question? Thanks, Steve. Um, hi, David. I have a question about FDA and product standards. So. As the marketplace currently sits, can you talk a little bit about or walk us through how if FDA did want to put a certain product standard in place that impacts cigars in the absence of a definition from FDA on what premiums actually are, would the FDA need to be applying that product standard universally to all cigar products? Um, so I think, I think that the definition I gave is pretty close to what FDA's definition of a premium cigar is. So I, I would suggest that the, the committee use that as their definition, um, unless FDA says anything different. FDA, the, the, one of the good things about um, product standards is they can be applied as broadly or as narrowly as FDA has the evidence to apply. So FDA could apply that to premium cigars that have certain characteristics and not to other premium cigars. FDA could apply to all premium cigars. FDA could apply to all cigars. FDA has that authority to make that decision, but all those decisions have to be based on the science that FDA has. And so I think that's why FDA is coming to you guys to say, where is the science lacking and what science needs to be done so that they can make those kind of decisions. And again, I point back to the meta um, ruling that basically said, should there be a fast track um, substantial equivalence um, pathway for premium cigars? And that's what I would suggest you focus on because that seems to be the effort, the issue that FDA is running into right now. Um, I may be missing that. Again, I'm not at FDA right now, so I may be missing that. 
but that's that's my best uh, guess right now. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, both uh, uh, David and Mike. We really appreciate your uh, presentations and responses to the Q and A. Um, and we'll move on to the uh, second panel, uh, which will focus on the perspectives of premium cigars from producers, retailers, and consumers. Uh, and we have several speakers, uh, Thomas Linegor, uh, who's the Senior Vice President of Scientific and Regulatory Affairs at the Scandinavian Tobacco Group. Um, and he's a coordinator of the Coresta subgroup on cigar, cigar smoking methods. Uh, Richard Voigt, President of Econosult. Uh, uh, Gerald Long, who's Manager of the Scientific Affairs at ITG Brands. Scott Pierce, Executive Director of the Premium Cigar Association and Mike Copperman, who's legislative director of the Cigar Rights of America. We also have two guests who will be uh, joining us um, uh, um, as discussants after the panel does its uh, presentations and will be participating in the Q&A. Uh, they're Dave, Drew Newman, who's the owner and general counsel of uh, JC Newman Cigar Company and Barry Shavitz, who's a partner at Fox uh, Rothschild. Uh, LLP. So uh, with that, uh, Thomas Lenegor, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, would, uh, shall I share my own presentation? I was just about to ask. I just wanted to confirm that you wanted me to share it. Yeah, yeah. if you can go ahead and do that, then I have yes. my uh, uh, mind free to do other stuff. Uh, no like problem. Seven. Can you see it? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. I hope you can okay. as well. Uh, great. Uh, well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to uh, present to the esteemed panel. I, um, I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, as mentioned, I work for a Scandinavian Tobacco Group. It is a company predominantly focused on focusing on cigars, but also uh, pipe tobacco. But we have a, a significant part of our business in the U.S. focusing primarily on uh, premium cigars. Uh, I obviously get uh, financially compensated to do what I do by Scandinavian Tobacco Group, luckily. Um, um, but the reason I'm here to present today is uh, actually on behalf of the organization Coresta, and I'll uh, get into that in a, in a bit. So uh, the presentation here is actually on behalf of the organization Coresta and not uh, Scandinavian Tobacco Group as such. Uh, please move to the uh, the next slide. And uh, just showing you briefly the agenda that I uh, will go through. Uh, I'll provide an introduction to what Coresta is for those who are not familiar with this organization, and then go into uh, tell you about some of the the relevant work that takes place in Coresta and some of the subgroups and the activities, including the. Uh, the group called Cigar Smoking Methods, where I am the uh, coordinator. Uh, briefly, I'll end up uh, explaining some of the resources that are available within Coresta about uh, research that is being published there and uh, take questions. Please, the next one. Good, so uh, Coresta is uh, an organization dating back to 1956 uh, the acronym uh, CRESTA is an acronym uh, and it's a French acronym, but it would translate into the Corporation Center for Scientific Research Relative to Tobacco. I will not try to uh, say it in French, but it is uh, basically an organization which is focused on science. Um, and uh, it, as you can see, the purpose stated down here is really to promote uh, cooperation around scientific issues in tobacco and uh, tobacco derived products. Uh, on the Coresta website, you can find all sorts of uh, information about the organization, including the statutes and rules, etc. Please move on to the next one. Uh, it is uh, quite a global organization with, uh, well, it says here just the recent count for 157 members from uh, all around the world. And it is, uh, I would say, uh, a nice mixture of uh, academic institutions, uh, universities, regulatory uh, agencies, FDA is a member, I believe, 
uh, some NGOs. It is suppliers to the uh, tobacco industry that supplies filters, papers, whatever it might be. Uh, contract research uh, organizations, uh, uh, suppliers of equipment such as machinery, uh, it's uh, commercial laboratories, uh, leaf suppliers, and obviously also uh, tobacco manufacturers here listed as consumer products uh, uh, of all sorts of sizes and uh, shapes. Uh, so please move ahead. Um, Coresta is organized uh, into different uh, areas of uh, science. There is an agronomy and, and leaf science uh, group. There is a group uh, under which there are uh, issues, obviously, such as agrochemicals uh, and uh, GSNA testing in, in leaf, uh, other things related to agronomy. There is the phytopathology uh, group and genetics uh, with pest management, uh, crop protection. There is the smoke science group, uh, which uh, have uh, subgroups on product uh, use behavior or toxicology. Um, and also uh, next generation products such as uh, vaping and, uh, and the likes. And then there is the product technology group um, where there are all sorts of uh, methods being developed that also goes for many of the other groups or areas. And within the product technology group, we have the uh, cigar smoking methods and uh, also uh, a subgroup called tobacco and tobacco products analysis. Uh, these are the two uh, working groups or subgroups I will be uh, talking about in the rest of the presentation. So uh, we have a lot of uh, scientists who work, uh, they're not employed by Coresta. This is all voluntary work, uh, so to say. No one gets paid other than a small secretariat uh, in Coresta. Uh, so uh, the members contribute to the work happening in Coresta and all these working groups. Uh, so <clears throat> that is the way it, it operates. Let's have the next one, please. Uh, just a little bit of uh, advertisement uh, for uh, Coresta, the Coresta website. We have uh, a description of, uh, there is a lot of resources available in there uh, stemming from the annual conferences and workshops and symposiums that are organized where the study groups uh, publish their work. Um, and this includes very specifically a lot of uh, different analytical methods and guides on how to do analytical work on tobacco products. And I will show you some examples of that. Uh, and it's a big resource of uh, uh, information for relevant to, to this business. Let's have the next one, please. And as I mentioned, there are uh, conferences uh, once per year typically, uh, and uh, they're often split into the acro side and the smoke uh, uh, technology side, uh, which uh, every second year meet and every second year have separate conferences. Uh, this year, it will be a, a virtual uh, conference, um, but I can highly uh, recommend uh, participating there uh, publicly available uh, at a cost, of course. Um, Let's move on to the next one. Good. I will focus on uh, two subgroups that uh, are most uh, relevant to the question of premium cigars. Uh, uh, that's not to say that none of the other uh, subgroups have done work which could be uh, relevant, but these are the ones that I've chosen to, uh, to talk about. And the first one being the tobacco and tobacco product analysis subgroup, TTPA. The objective of this group is really to come up with what we refer to as Coresta recommended methods, CRMs, um, and then maintain these methods, uh, update them as technology advances, uh, et cetera. Um, and in this case, about testing uh, tobacco and unburned tobacco products. So analyze all sorts of uh, constituents in tobacco and develop the uh, the methods 
uh, to make sure that they are uh, validated and reliable. Uh, the typical uh, part of the work done in a group like this is to also organize interlaboratory testing, collaborative studies uh, related to, to these methods to demonstrate that the uh, but what the uh, repeatability and reproducibility of such methods are typically something that accredited laboratories need to participate in these sort of studies to uh, demonstrate their uh, proficiency in, in using these uh, methods. Uh, let's move to the uh, the next one there we have we can see uh, an overview of uh, the methods under the TTPA group, which are relevant to cigar tobacco. Uh, cigar tobacco in general, not just cigar tobacco used in premium uh, cigars, but cigar tobacco in general. So there are methods to uh, test for the water content, the nicotine content, the pH, TSNAs, uh, moisture, ammonia, benzapyrin, water activity, uh, an expanded list of polyaromatic hydrocarbons and metals. Uh, these uh, methods are specifically uh, validated also for cigar tobacco. Uh, but in tobacco, this is not in smoke. It's important to uh, keep in mind. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, I'll talk uh, somewhat more about the cigar smoking method uh, group uh, because there I am the coordinator. And uh, here we have actually done work specifically related to uh, premium cigars. But the overall objective of this group, which has existed for many years, is really also to update uh, and maintain uh, uh, methods uh, to investigate uh, the analytical or mechanical smoking of cigars and also to do collaborative studies. We do a collaborative study every year on uh, cigars where a number of laboratories around the world participate. And we, uh, through updating the methods, uh, try to improve uh, repeatability and reproducibility uh, for, the, uh, for the method uh, and establish con confidence intervals for the smoke yields. But let's uh, have a look at, uh, at some of the methods uh, under, under this subgroup. These are the smoking, uh, the, the methods related to the, uh, the smoking uh, analysis of cigars. And um, uh, they're, they're divided up into there is a specific method to test for nicotine, there is a specific method for sampling, there is etc. But uh, together you use these methods to, to do the, uh, uh, the smoke analysis of cigars. The issue is that these methods are not uh, applicable to premium cigars. There are some technical issues and uh, Dr. David Ashley uh, referred to it uh, about premium cigars that make them a lot more complicated to smoke on a machine. Uh, the varying size, the, uh, the uh, variability in the structure of the, the, the leaves, the, uh, the way they are designed, they don't, uh, they're so diverse in their uh, designs that they often don't fit uh, into a standardized method. And uh, please move to the next one. And the fact that this is the case, these methods do not really reply, uh, apply to uh, premium cigars um, or are not applicable for, for premium cigars. There was a work, uh, there was a project initiated in this working group to actually uh, overcome the limitation and challenges related to uh, smoke collection for uh, handmade long filler cigars, which would be the same as uh, premium cigars for almost irrespective of what of all these many definitions we've heard. Um, and uh, this year was, uh, this uh, project was initiated a couple of years ago and now a technical guide has been developed and a collaborative study uh, have been conducted and I will uh, go through the results of that. It is important to, to note that the results that you get out of a smoking analysis and uh, Dr. David Ashley already uh, uh, mentioned that 
that these results do not directly provide an estimate of human exposure. These results are only, the results that come out of smoking analysis is only uh, useful to compare or rank different products. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, this particular collaborative study worked uh, like all other collaborative studies on smoking really uh, in a way where uh, we had eight laboratories uh, participating and they all smoked the same cigars from uh, and you see the picture of the cigars that were chosen to be included in the study here. Uh, so very different cigars, uh, all premium handmade cigars, but of very different size and also shape. Uh, you might see, you might be able to distinguish on the picture that cigar number A was has a square shape where the others are more or less round and one of them even being sort of, uh, we call it sort of a pyramid or torpedo shaped uh, cigar, the D cigar. Uh, some of the things that uh, cause challenges when you want to seal it in a machine, uh, putting a, a square peg in a round hole, uh, as you might imagine, uh, can cause problems. Um, but there are many other sort of technical details which I'll not bore you with, but uh, uh, which means that we had to uh, make modifications to the existing smoking methods in order to accommodate these products. Please move on. Here you see some of the results that come out of a uh, collaborative study such as this. What you see uh, on the uh, y-axis is the nicotine content in smoke measured in milligrams per cigar. And you uh, see laboratory number one to six, only six laboratories were able to test sample number A. Sample number A was what, the big square cigar. Uh, the two remaining laboratories uh, did not have a smoking machine that could accommodate a cigar of this size. Um, and the interesting part about this particular graph, which is quite illustrative of uh, the results that we were getting, is that uh, you can see that re uh, laboratory number uh, one found results between 30 milligrams and 40. Uh, the small uh, black crosses are individual cigars and the green dot is the mean value. Uh, whereas uh, laboratory number two found results of the same cigar from the same batch uh, of cigars uh, between uh, five and 20 milligrams. So they were not even overlapping and you can see how the other laboratories sort of were in between uh, these. And a big part of the purpose of these type of collaborative studies is exactly to uh, determine the repeatability, which would be the variability within the lab, uh, and the reproducibility is the variability between laboratories, which is obviously extremely important to know if you want to compare data from two different laboratories or from one uh, test to another within the same laboratory. Like, for example, when there are uh, tar ceilings or uh, requirements to report the tar levels for cigarettes, as there has been in many countries uh, around the world, it is obviously important to understand the tolerance of the, uh, uh, the method. Let's move to the next one. And here is a summary of the repeatability and the re reproducibility uh, values that were found in this collaborative study. And the repeatability within laboratory for nicotine is that when you test one of these cigars uh, um, and you test it several times, you're gonna get a variability between approximately 50% to 80% uh, of the mean relative to the mean value. And uh, for the tar, you would get somewhere between 30 and 115% uh, variability. Uh, and you can see the numbers for CO. And obviously the variability uh, between laboratories is even higher. Uh, so for, for nicotine between 56% up to 120% variation 
of testing the same cigar in two different laboratories. So a very, very significant uh, variation uh, in the results, uh, much, much bigger than what we see for uh, regular cigars and or machine-made cigars. Uh, and uh, dramatically higher than what is seen for, for cigarettes. Can you move to the next one, please? Uh, here we try to compare the results uh, with previous studies of machine-made cigars. The machine-made cigar, we showed the, uh, uh, the repeatability on the uh, y-axis and the weight of the cigar on the uh, x-axis. Um, and uh, the uh, the different samples A B C D E uh, shown on the the graph here, uh, and as you can see, the uh, variability increases with the weight of the product you test, and we can also see that uh, the variability of these premium cigars are uh, significantly above what we have seen in uh, in in previous studies of machine made cigars. Please move on. So uh, this study cannot really explain the factors that are driving this uh, significant variability from cigar to cigar, uh, but uh, the results, uh, when we look at them in total, actually uh, indicates that the, the method is quite robust, uh, but the variability in, in the actual cigars are uh, just from one cigar to the next is so significant that uh, that you see this uh, enormous uh, variability in the uh, outcome of the uh, test. And it is typically not possible to discriminate between the results of uh, two cigars unless uh, the weight difference between the cigars is about a factor of two that uh, is sort of uh, pretty much what we find. So a cigar like A and B, which were like 15% uh, different in weight and completely different shape and different blends and uh, different origins of the tobaccos, etc., we could not discriminate the, uh, the results based on smoke yields. Uh, uh, the same uh, for the uh, D and E uh, cigars, even though one was a pyramid-shaped cigar and the other one was a cylindrical, much longer and uh, again, quite different in weight, we could not discriminate the uh, results just because of the variability. So the... Uh, just uh, so we give the others a fair chance, uh, how many more, uh, much more do you have left? Uh, uh... Uh, basically, this is the only... Uh, a really important slide. I, there is just a reference to the uh, Coresta website after this, then I will be done. Great. Good. So the implication really is that smoke uh, analysis uh, currently has very uh, significant limitations if you want to compare uh, different products, just as Dr. Ashley uh, actually also referred to, and it's very clearly demonstrated here. Let's quickly go through the, uh, the last slide. So have a look at the Coresta website. You will find a lot of uh, research related to cigars, but much, much less than what you would find on cigarettes, obviously. 150 abstracts related to cigars, but only two related to premium cigars. You would find thousands related to, uh, to cigarettes. And I think that's a, a fair picture of what you see in the literature in, in general. Uh, the next one, please. And then. And these are just examples of some of the studies. Uh, move on to the next one, please. Uh, an example of a study on premium cigars, which have been published there. You can find it on the Caress, the website. I think that's uh, it. You can move to the last slide. Oh, uh, that's just a summary. I don't really need to do that. So. Many thanks. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all of that information. And I know uh, uh, Mr. Voith and uh, Mr. Long have uh, ceded you a little bit of their time. So uh, I know they have, uh, they'll be briefer. So Mr. Voith, you want to go ahead? Amy, um, 
Let me let me share my screen, I guess. Sure, go ahead. You should you should be able to do that. Okay. Uh, it's not right. Come on. We can see it. You can see it. Yes. Yeah. Go it's, ahead. It's, so it's not can. for center view, but we can see it. Oh yeah. Well, maybe I can move it to the center view. Is it is it okay? Yeah, if you hit the bot button on the very bottom that looks like a screen, it'll be in presenter view. Ooh, we just lost it. I think we can view it the way you had it before. Uh, okay, so I apologize for this difficulty here. Um, no worries. Just expand it back up with the big, big square. Square. And if it's easier, I could go ahead and share your slides. Well, why not um, you share my slides, please? Okay. Thank you. One moment. Right. If you want to get started, go ahead. Yes. A moment. Okay. So, good afternoon. Um, I'm an economist. I'm a founding principal of EconSult Solutions, call ourselves ESI. Uh, we're an economics consulting firm based in Philadelphia. Um, First of all, I want to thank you for the privilege of presenting to this panel, um, examining the health effects and patterns of premium cigars, um, the patterns of use of premium cigars. I'm going to talk about our study of the purchasing patterns and demographics of, of online cigar customers. And just sort of for the disclosure part of this, um, we were hired, uh, this was a report that was con contract research. Um, by the Cigar so Association of America, Cigar Rights America, and International Premium Cigar and Pipe Retailers Association. So um, we were paid um, by the industry. So um, with that, I will begin. Next slide, please. So our study examines a very large uh, set of data uh, on online cigar purchases. Um, we have data from five, the five of the largest um, cigar, online premium cigar companies, Best Cigar, Cigars International, Famous Smoke Shop, JR Cigars, and Thompson Cigars. Uh, they provided the data. So these four retailers provided data on their online sales from 2014 to 2000, uh, all four provided from 2014 to 2016, all retailers, all five for 2017, and a, a couple of the retailers provided limited data for 2018. To give you an idea of the uh, scale of the data, um, there are over 12 million orders. Um, there are 2.3 million customers. And interesting um, for the topics that have been discussed so far today, interesting uh, things are that there's over 70,000 SKU, stock keeping units. Um, those are company specific things that are not the same across companies, but they're how they track their stock. There's a huge number, huge variety of, in premium cigars. Um, note that stock keeping units aren't the same as uh, universal product codes that manufacturers have. And just to point out sort of the heterogeneity in this market, um, you know, retailers like the ones we see here will take um, manufacture of product or product that is made by hand in the case of um, premium cigars and repackage them into samplers with several different kinds of cigars into a sampler and they'll have a, their own SKU but they won't have a UPC um, which just makes things complicated but it's also consistent with the, the notion that uh, there's a lot of variability and heterogeneity and um, premium cigars. So like everyone in this area knows, uh, I'm sure more than I, um, there's a challenge um, in, uh, one challenge in analyzing premium cigar sales is defining um, what's a premium cigar. All of these uh, retailers sell premium and non-premium cigars. Some of them make their own de uh, designation of a premium cigar versus non-premium, but not all. So in our study, um, we define premium cigars using criteria um, that was used in the past study, uh, K 
Catherine Corey's definition. She's an FDA Center for Tobacco Products researcher. Um, and, and basically we use the, the path study definition for premium cigars. And when you look at that, you see that premium cigars um, that are designated by Corey cover a lot of the cigars that are in our study, uh, about half. Um, for the cases where we had industry definitions of, or designations of premium cigars, they almost they matched with Corey's almost perfectly. So um, for the remaining cigars that were amongst the sales that we had, we attempted to provide uh, to, to use Corey's definition of premium cigars and apply it to um, the remaining cigars. So we ultimately, um, our data in current, current included the purchase of 389 million uh, premium cigars, um, as I said, with 70,000 SKUs. And if you look at um, the scale of the market, it's about $1.1 billion worth of sales in our, in our data. Um, another um, challenge in defining, you know, we're, we're our company and our study fo is focused on purchasing cigars, not the health effects. We're just looking at who's buying the cigars and how do they do it. Um, this data um, is really great for that because we can see the same person buying cigars multiple times. We can uh, we know uh, basically where their, their purchases are made in terms of the, their own community location, things like that address. But one of the things that's a challenge in measuring um, premium cigars is, is to understand the, the total size of the premium cigar market um, and the market share of what our uh, online retailers have. And um, it's been noted earlier that um, that most premium cigars are imported um, and hence they pay taxes, the harm in, um, on, the, on the cigars. And uh, we common way to estimate uh, and rough and approximate way of estimating the total amount of premium cigars is to take the, the highest two price categories of the harmonized, harmonized tax categories and call them premium cigars. It's probably an overestimate of the total number of premium cigars, but there's uh, 300 by that measure in a um, given year, as opposed to 389 million cigars and samples over the entire sample period. In a given year, in like 2017, where we have complete data, uh, there were 300, we, we estimate the thing to be about the market size to be 350 million um, premium cigars. Overall, our retailers sold 125 million. Uh, um, Richard? Richard, yes. can you just let me know when to advance slides? I can't see what's next, oh. so I'm not sure what slide. Oh, you know what? I, I'm sorry. You're supposed to be on slide three. Yeah, uh, and we're going to need to move through these a little bit more quickly. So okay. um, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I will go much more quickly. Um, Thank you. Um, I just wanted to just say that there, there were the, the issues and challenges are. So we have data on the age of the purchaser. Um, and we have their nine digit zip code. So we have a very pre precise understanding of where the communities are that they bought them. We don't know anything about the people. We know about the cigars and we know about the pricing, but we don't know um, specifically about the people from uh, who, who purchased them. But because we have nine digit zip codes, we can link it very closely to small area geography, census tracts, and know about their communities that they come from. So, we can look at things like income and education, which is what we looked at. You could look at other things as well. If you look at the demographics, um, the average age of pre uh, premium cigar purchases in our, in our sample is 55. The median age is 57. Um, if you, there is a very, a relatively modest, small size of uh, things that are designated as premium cigars. It doesn't even fit into some people's definitions. The age there is an average age of 52, median age is 53. Still a relatively old sample relative to the US as a whole. Um, one thing about age, there are no, uh, amongst these five retailers, there are no underage sales. Everyone uses third party age verification um, in their process to the extent that that's effective. Um, 
there are no underage sales, we would not know them if there were. Um, if you look at income and education, consistent with things that have been discussed earlier in these two panels, 15% um, of um, there, that cigar purchases are reside in communities um, that on average are higher income levels and higher education levels. So um, I think we've heard that uh, earlier today, perhaps that was from Michael. Um, so our information on purchasing um, the communities people pr come from are, are higher, higher income and higher education. If you look at the purchasing, pat purchasing patterns, here's some kind of interesting stuff that may be a little different than people expect. Uh, one, premium cigar purchases are infrequent buyers. Um, for any given a company, 44% uh, of the purchasers made only one purchase. 86% um, ordered 10 or fewer times. Um, so there are, there is um, not, a, not a lot of repeat um, um, sort of purchases. And very few people um, have multiple orders. The other thing that's interesting is that um, the patterns of consumption are really seasonal. They, they rise um, near Father's Day and they stay up in the summer and then they fall again in the fall uh, with slight bump upwards in holidays. And that repeats year after year for our, our sample period anyway. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, there's incredible diversity in the products. 25% um, of the products sold uh, included one, uh, one of the orders included at least one quote unquote sample pack where it included multiple different cigars. So it seems like um, people who are using premium cigars um, are looking for variety um, or that, that is one conclusion uh, you, that you might draw from this. So the overall conclusions um, of this study are that purchases are older, they live in higher median income communities, they have higher levels of education. Um, they're not purchasing on, uh, cigars on regular or consistent basis. Um, they, they seem to be all over the map. And um, so in that, in that sense, they, there seems to be, you know, and, and the industry itself has huge heterogeneity in what they're supplying. So what are the limitations of the study? Um, so first of all, we're only looking at online sales, right? So that may be a systematically different group than um, others. Uh, we're on, and moreover, we're looking at large online retailers um, who can afford to have third party age verification, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, that's one limitation. Um, second limitation is we don't really have customer demographics. What we have is the demographics of the community where the customer lives. Uh, in my opinion, as a person who's worked in that realm for a long time, that's a pretty good indicator when you're talking about um, millions of transactions. Um, we have uh, one challenging um, uh, feature of the data is it's hard to ensure that unique customers haven't um, purchased you know, one from one company, another from another company, and another another purchase from a third company. We we estimate that to be less than five and a half, about less than five percent, um, on the basis of you know looking at common birthdays and common nine so, so digits of codes. The bottom line of all all of this is is that um, this is one um, really good window on a big chunk of um, the premium cigar market. Um, and, and who's purchasing them, how they're purchased. And in the report that we wrote, there's obviously a lot more detail than I have presented here and happy to discuss anything that people would like to talk about. So Great. thanks well, very much. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, and uh, uh, I know we're, uh, we're running behind, but uh, Mr. Long, I want to give you your, your measure of time. Okay. I'm going to try to share my screen. <laughs> okay. Did that work? 
Yes, we, we can we can see it. You're 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 in uh not in the presenter mode, but we can read it. How about now? No. Yeah, you have to go to the lower right corner. Yeah, I did that. And look at the little screen and click on there you go. You're in business. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for your patience. And <laughs> I'd like to say thanks to the uh, academies for the opportunity to come and talk with you today. And uh, as mentioned, I am a manager of scientific affairs for ITG Brands, and I'm on loan actually to Tobacco Lara USA. So <clears throat> I would say that uh, it's always great for scientists to get together on a Friday afternoon to talk about data. So today I'd like to share uh, some premium cigar HPHC data that demonstrates uh, some of the challenges in using this kind of data as a metric for comparison of uh, premium cigars for regulatory purposes. All right, so now I'm going to try to advance. So uh, for these products that were tested, the definition of a premium cigar here is that it was wrapped in a whole leaf of tobacco, contains 100% uh, leaf tobacco binder, is made manually by combining the wrapper, filler, and binder, has no filter tip or non-tobacco mouthpiece, and is kept by hand, and weighs more than six pounds per thousand. The reason we use this definition is because the current uh, court-endorsed definition of a premium cigar did not exist at the time these data were collected. We, we actually, uh, again, did 91 premium cigar products, 43 different sizes, 18 different blends, if you will, of dark air cured tobacco. Uh, testing parameters. All of these were conducted, uh, collected at a commercial accredited contract laboratory. All, were, all testing was done using the best correct crest of methods that were available at the time, although, uh, as mentioned earlier, a lot of these are not validated for large hand rolled cigars. Physical measurements, 40 replicates per cigar, six HPHCs in filler with seven replicates, eight HPHCs in smoke, seven replicates, and then 20 replicates for TNCA. So a lot of data, unfortunately, Time uh, does not permit us to review all of the data, but let's take a look at a couple of examples. We'll start with uh, some data on actual tobacco filler itself or the tobacco cigar. You'll notice that this plot is actually a, a plot of tobacco in and in, and it's normalized per gram of tobacco. Uh, and so this will provide us with a level of NNN independent of the cigar size since it's normalized. And on the x-axis, we actually see the 91 different products with uh, code numbers from the laboratory. And these are indicated as box plots. I'll draw your attention to the fact that there are two main regions on the graph. The first region we call blend A. Blend A all of the cigars that were tested, I think there are 18 of them, had the same blend. The second region are the other 73 cigars that shared 17 unique blends. The main point here that I wanna make is the range that you observe for the blend A group is arguably the same or maybe even larger than the range that you observe for the other 17 plants. And we actually contend that this is a property of dark air cured tobacco as used in premium cigars. Another observation that you see here is related to the procedure that was used to collect these samples. And I'll draw your attention to uh, each of the two regions has a blue line. 
And the blue line <coughs> on the, the region that's to the left of the blue line was analyzed in August of 2007. And the right half in April of 2018. More importantly, the right half is actually a representation of the variability within each cigar sample since individual cigars were analyzed to produce the data. Okay, on the left side, what happened was <clears throat> the box plot that, that resulted from the analysis was when all seven cigars that went into that particular sample were combined to produce a composite sample and then analyzed. Finally, the biggest concern here <clears throat> is, for instance, that we were comparing, or excuse me, here's an example of one. If we were to compare, for example, these two samples, based upon these data, we would argue that they are different when in fact, they're really the same. All right, so now, Consider some smoke data. So this is uh, carbon monoxide uh, plotted in milligrams per cigar, again, across all 91 products tested. I guess the bottom line here is there's a lot of variability in the data, which makes it difficult, as others have said, to discriminate between cigars of different sizes, except for you know, the extreme cases, like, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, these are really small cigars and these are big cigars. Also, I did a quick calculation based upon a statement that Thomas Lindegaard uh, made earlier about comparison of smoke data for premium cigars needing to be different by a factor of two in weight before you can see a difference in HPHC yield. So the circled uh, box plots are for a 44 and a half, 44 by five and a half versus a 52 by eight and a half cigars, which are roughly twice in weight. So in this case, you would be able to resolve differences in those cigars. So. In summary, HPHCs in tobacco or in smoke probably are not viable metrics for distinguishing or comparing premium handmade cigars due to several factors. First is the inherent variability of the cigar itself. It's a handmade artisan product. The second is the natural variability in the tobacco. We saw an example of that for the NNN data. The third one is around variability of the sm uh, cigar smoking results. And I don't have time to talk about that right now, but perhaps we can discuss that during the Q&A session. Cigar smoking and tobacco filling, uh, filling testing methods uh, are not standardized. Uh, Crest is making some great progress, but you heard about some of those challenges. And then more importantly, comparison of cigars based upon HPHC results could erroneous, erroneously conclude that the cigars are different when in fact they really are not. So with that, I'll turn over my remaining time. Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate your uh, sticking to the time limit here. That's very helpful. Um, so let's turn now to um, Mr. Pierce. All right, uh, I'm going to change it up here a little bit. Um, I'm not going to share any slides, so hopefully we won't have to worry about any technical difficulties here. Although I do have some show and tell, so hopefully it'll be a, a little bit more interactive. Uh, so my name is Scott Pierce, and I'm the executive director of the Premium Cigar Association. Uh, so that's who I work for, and so that is who I am funded by. The Premium Cigar Association uh, was made reference to a little bit earlier from, uh, by eConsult. It used to be called the International Premium Cigar and Pipe Retailers Association. So this association was founded in 1933 and primarily represents uh, retailers, mom and pop brick and mortar retail shops across the country, about 3000 retailers um, in all 50 states. Um, 
So what that means is that uh, it's, it's always physical locations, uh, not really any online uh, only uh, members that belong to us. Um, now we have variations in terms of who our members are, and I'll kind of go through that a little bit. And I think I want to kind of give a lay of the land here in terms of, we've talked a lot about product construction and testing, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to give an overview about kind of where the consumers are meeting with the retailers, how they're uh, purchased and how they're consumed. Um, a premium cigar lounge, they, uh, there's different types. You can have a retail store where no smoking is allowed, where consumers walk in, they purchase and they go. They have the lounges that do allow smoking where they're able to go in and purchase and enjoy a cigar. And then we have cigar bars where you see a lot of this uh, coming up lately, where you can also enjoy some libations at the same time while you're enjoying a premium cigar. The reason why we think it's really important to distinguish a premium cigar versus other tobacco products and why it relates to the retailers, whom we call tobacconists, uh, is because it relates to the why of the smoking and the enjoyment of it. It was alluded to a little earlier that the purchases are infrequent and seasonal. And from a retailer's perspective, the customers that they see most often is that these purchases are by and large uh, singular purchases, whether they be gifts or whether they be celebratory in, in nature. So whether it's buddies going out for uh, smoking on a golf trip or celebrating a wedding, celebrating the birth of a child or some other milestone, that is the vast majority of purchases uh, that relate to our retail stores. Uh, for those that do come in and enjoy cigars, we've talked about this before, they generally do take uh, much more than an hour or so in order to enjoy a premium cigar. Some uh, comments were made a little bit earlier, too, as it relates to the, the blogs or the cigar shows. And this is something that is uh, particularly fascinating and interesting as it relates to this industry and why, again, the designation of premium cigar, I think, is important here. The reason why these pop up is because for a lot of the same reasons that we've talked about in the construction of the cigars is the, the tasting of it, the enjoyment of it, the hobby aspect of why people get into it is very similar to why people enjoy and get very into wine or bourbon, for example. And so we talk about various tobacco products and the relationships could very well be likened to wine. It could very well be likened to whiskey, whether you enjoy Irish whiskey, rice, or bourbons. It's a similar type of concept for the same reasons that consumers are enjoying a premium cigar. And the importance of understanding why the consumers are enjoying premium cigars and where they're enjoying them has direct relationship to the actual health data that we're all kind of trying to figure out. And the reason why is because we know that from this path study, if you're enjoying a premium cigar roughly 1.7 days out of 30, we believe that that does not indicate any sort of pattern of addictiveness. What this does indicate to us, again, is that it is seasonal, but it also is an enjoyment factor of the same way that if you're sipping 1.7 scotches a month, probably is not going to make you an alcoholic and is not indicative of alcoholic behavior. So that's why that past study is very important for us. It, the other aspect of it is, is that while we've talked about nicotine and delivery to the system, the cigars then would be a pretty poor uh, uh, nicotine delivery device if, if people are not going back to it for that purpose. The purpose of an enjoyment of a premium cigar, it really falls down to this experience that the consumers are enjoying. And we've seen this grow through our retailers in the way the retailers have really advanced and evolved the, cu the customer experience when coming into a lounge. And by that, we mean that this is no longer just simply come in, buy some sort of product, and then you're done. Our retailers, they, they get to know their customers. They know them by name. I have a little show and tell here just to show you real quick. This is something that we uh, produce along with our partners at Tobacconist University. It's a handbook. This handbook is replete with information about the construction. I can show that and we can also kind of give you guys some links and things like that. But this handbook goes through the construction of cigars, how the cigars are made and grown and why different flavors are going to be presented and nuances of the cigars. This is specifically for our retailers to learn and understand because they consider themselves cigar sommeliers to their customers who come in. They're taking them on a journey to understand why they want to enjoy something versus something else. The reason why they get to know the customer so well is because they want to know their palates because they're going to be able to provide to them a better experience. This is vastly different when you contrast it with somebody who really just needs to get a quick nicotine fix and runs out for a few seconds to then run back in. This is something where you're slowing down and taking time to enjoy it. So when we look at the broad base of this, we understand why the demographics in the path study lead to you being older when you very first come into it, when you first experience your first premium cigar, and why the rate at which you enjoy a premium cigar is very, very different. So we believe that the juxtaposition between the two shouldn't necessarily be, is it a cigar versus a cigarette? It really should be, 
where is the, where are the premium cigars being enjoyed? How are they being enjoyed and the frequency? Because we know that that has an impact on the overall population health. And if that's really what we're trying to determine here, which we all agree we are, then we truly believe that why people are enjoying these premium cigars and, and how they're experiencing it has a direct effect on their health outcomes while enjoying these products. Because as Dr. Gottlieb said, any sort of enjoyment that we have with some of these things poses some sort of risk, right? Whether it's alcohol, sugar, red meat, or tobacco, we know that there are relative risks with any of these products. And so understanding the consumption rates, the why, it makes a very important, uh, makes it very important for, our, for the research to denote so that that way we can truly get to the heart of exactly the rates at which this is, uh, the, these are being consumed and the impacts it's having on the consumers. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll just, I'll wrap up there. Um, and the last key point I do want to make as it relates to all of this, uh, and then I'll turn the time over to my colleague, Mike Copperman, is that the importance of our stores really is that these are adult products and they're sold to adult consumers. Uh, you go into a, a cigar lounge and it is full of adults and really it's a very social uh, experience. And so people get into cigars because friends, et cetera, and it's a very social experience as far as that is concerned. And all of our stores have our, our research and our data that, that present and say, you must be, you know, we ID under 27, for example. Uh, I, and we are very, very good and have had benchmarks in place for a very long time in terms of not selling anything to anybody underage. And it's very, you, you never see anybody walking into a premium tobacco store uh, that, that is, uh, that's young. There's no youth access problem as the PATH study kind of denotes. And I, the last piece of that really ultimately is, is that the FDA has even said that premium cigars are the lowest enforcement priority because they can't see a, a substantial youth access risk here. And so on, on that note, um, I would just like to, to thank the, the National Academy for this opportunity and would like to go ahead and turn the, the time over to Mike Kupperman. Thank you. So uh, Mr. Kupperman, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Adult populations who from time to time enjoy the pleasures of a fine handcrafted premium cigar do so with moderation. We share the concern of FDA and public health groups who wish to ensure children never have any relationship with tobacco products. We also wish to acknowledge our appreciation for this invite today by the National Academy of the Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and wish to thank them and respected committee members for the opportunity to speak. Cigar Rights of America serves as the sole voice of handcrafted cigar consumers in the United States on matters of legislative and regulatory concern with a membership that spans all 50 states. The cornerstone of our CRA membership is the coalition of premium handcrafted cigar manufacturers representing 47 diverse artisan producers of our handmade products. These manufacturer members are predominantly family owned and entrepreneurial small business businesses built upon the skills often passed down from generations to generations. And I'm going to actively edit in the interest of time as we go through. So uh, please bear with me. Uh, we certainly applaud the focus earlier that Dr. Ashley uh, focused on when he discussed the population risk standard. Uh, we wish to respectfully point out uh, that it is our view that the incorrect evidentiary standard was applied, certainly by two executive orders and the statute would have suggested that the population risk be assigned, but it was abundantly clear when the deeming rule was promulgated that rather than a population risk standard, it was an individual hazard where the comments reflected the degree to which uh, there appear to be a burden on industry uh, to show that in any circumstance, there's never any harm done, uh, which is a standard without a precedent. Uh, we wish to uh, further uh, simply add uh, that by our estimate and the review of the science, uh, always science that we've never funded and most often than not FDA or government funded science that there has not been shown a compelling uh, need for regulating in the ways that have been proposed. And it's our assertion with respect, the FDA does not adequately assess the cost benefits and distributional effects of regulating. With regards to the definition, uh, we appreciate all of the uh, inquiries uh, by the committee. Uh, just uh, for clarity, Cigar Rights of America endorses 
the definition of a premium cigar cited by FDA in American Academy of Pediatrics at Al versus Food and Drug Administration and last year in the US District Court for the District of Columbia Judge Amit Mehta's opinion in Cigar Association of America at Al versus United States FDA at Al Cigar Rights of America. And uh, PCA of course was also named in that suit. Uh, that definition, of course, uh, has eight components. It has been cited before and will be included in our submission. Uh, moreover, we did appreciate some of the earlier comments uh, by Dr. Ashley that reflect the degree to which there have been a myriad agency and court and legislative proposals that share many of uh, the very same definitional uh, characteristics. Uh, we wish to uh, lightly touch upon congressional intent of the Family Smoking uh, Prevention and Tobacco Control Act uh, that was really focused on youth usage and access and on mortality and morbidity. Uh, we've been very proud to have bipartisan efforts uh, in the last six Congresses, including this one uh, by uh, members of the Senate and House on both sides of the aisle uh, that have included doctors and nurses and have recognized the uh, vast distinctions between premium cigars uh, and the ways in which we don't have the level of mortality and morbidity and youth usage that have risen to the level of concern for public policy health officials. Included amongst our progressive Democrat luminaries are names such as uh, Kathy Castor, Senator Tom Harkin, and a former HHS Secretary and Member of Congress, Donna Shalala, who in discussing the uh, last Congress's Pallone bill, uh, cites that uh, cigars uh, need to have a unique status. And there was a virtually uh, unanimous uh, consent among the Democratic Caucus that premium cigars ought to be exempt from the SE rule, lest members think that this is a partisan or industry issue, as has been suggested. Uh, to briefly touch upon patterns of use and health effects of users, the data shows clearly youth simply do not use premium cigars. The small segment of adults who are premium cigar consumers use the products infrequently, and the premium cigar consumers are older, higher income, and better educated than other categories. Uh, from the opening of the administrative docket on the ANPRM on cigars in 18, the agency cited as the model example of data uh, needed a study conducted by FDA staff and led by Dr. Catherine Corey. Uh, FDA explained in the paper cigar smoking patterns and tobacco use behaviors varied by cigar type and that there are clear distinctions between premium and non-premium smoker characteristics, use patterns, and purchasing behaviors. Dr. Corey's work shows clear distinctions between usage patterns for premium cigars and other cigar types and cigarettes. According to Dr. Corey, the overall adult prevalence of premium cigar usage is dramatically lower than that of cigarettes. The median age of first regular use of premium cigars is well into adulthood and much older than uh, that of other types of uh, tobacco products. Uh, those adults who are current users tend to be substantially, uh, I, I beg your pardon, uh, premium cigars are consumed far less frequently with the median consumer using the product 1.7 days a month and 93.3% using the product less than daily. In addition, those using premium cigars are much less likely than those using non-premium cigars also to smoke cigarettes uh, the uh, NERA analysis of the PATH data, which will be included in the CRA submission, also demonstrates premium cigar consumers are significantly less likely to use cigarettes than consumers of non-premium. Overall, three PATH waves, the median premium cigar consumer smoked cigarettes on zero days over a 30-day period. The dual-use data only reinforces this conclusion, and we delve once again, more heavily into that in the host of uh, data that we will be sending in by May 
seventh, I believe, with regards to health effects on users, and then I'll stop there in respect of others' time. In the most recent wave of the PATH study, as has been suggested, the median consumer uh, is less than 1.3 days a month. I think this is very important, speaks to earlier comments regarding monograph nine, particularly that there was no statistical deviation between all-cause mortality, which as you know dovetails nicely with the idea of a population standard, when you look at premium cigar users versus never tobacco smokers, 1.02 risk ratio versus 1.0. And it's important because we knew in 97 when it was published and we know even better now through FDA's finance path studies that the underlying assumption for frequency of one to two a day bears no resemblance to what the actual use is age. It's much closer to one to two cigars a month, not a day. But even at one point, uh, one to two a day, it shows no statistical deviation at the all-cause mortality level. And when you adjust for the conflation in the views and for dose response and sample size and pH and frequency of use, inhalation patterns and so on, uh, what one finds is that in the host of other uh, comorbidities, uh, premium cigars, in fact, do not create, by our estimate, a warrant for uh, the rather uh, stark uh, proposals that have been suggested in the past. Uh, with uh, that, uh, I wish to thank uh, the committee uh, for the time that you've allowed Cigar Rights of America today. We look forward to submitting our data in service of furthering the committee's understanding of the health effects and usage of premium handcrafted cigars. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. Um, and uh, so thanks to all of our presenters. I will, we are running a little short of time, so I'm going to ask the committee uh, to keep their questions brief and the uh, uh, responders as well. Uh, so the presenters are joined also, as I mentioned, by uh, Drew Newman and Barry Shavitz, so they're here as well. Um, so with that, um, committee, questions for Neil first each time. And I, um, all, all these questions just keep on popping up as people present. So my, um, my question is mostly for Mr. Lindegard, but perhaps also for, for Mr. Long. Um, one is, what is the Caresta method that's been used? What are the parameters in terms of the um, puff volume, the puff duration, the intervals? Uh, what's the end point? Because I, I don't know how you um, try to figure that out when people smoke cigars so differently. I would like to uh, start with that. It is, we, you, in terms of uh, puff volumes, etc. The puff volume is uh, decided based on the size of the cigar. So it's a, a mathematical formula, uh, which I cannot reference by heart, but uh, it relates to the diameter and uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the cigar. So the puff volume uh, varies, depends on the cigar. It's uh, clearly described in the, uh, the Caresta recommended method for uh, cigar smoking. We use the same uh, parameters as in the uh, method which is described for uh, regular cigars. Uh, and the puff interval is one puff per 40 seconds um, and, a, and a two second duration. And so what is the end point? Do you do it until it gets burned down to a certain amount uh, to the tip or do you do it over a certain period of time? It's to a, a certain butt length, uh, uh, like it would be for, uh, and uh, is it 35 milliliter, uh, 30, 35 millimeters? I, I'm not 100% sure of the exact butt length, but uh, it's to a, a specific butt length uh, of the cigar. And so, what would be the typical time for a premium cigar to be <laughs> pumped by machine? <laughs> Uh, well, it uh, depends very much on the size. The uh, the bigger ones you saw, that would be uh, uh, one and a half to two hours uh, for one cigar. Uh, you can smoke multiple cigars at the same time, of course, at the machine. But uh, uh, And the smaller ones would maybe be half an hour. Great. And I don't know if David Ashley is still here, but 
fact that there's so much variability in testing from the same product over time still brings back the first question about how do you ever regulate the characteristics of a cigar when you can't even take the same cigar company uh, brand and when you retest it, you can get twofold variations. And how can you say, how can you define what a product is? And I, I don't know if David's still here or Mike wants to comment on that. Yeah, I don't think they're, uh, Neil, we need to move on. So in the few moments that we have for everybody. So um, I think hopefully we can uh, uh, send questions offline to uh, some of the speakers to get all the, all the details. Kim? Yes, thank you for the information that you presented today. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about your consumers' perceptions about the use of premium cigars, specifically their perceptions around how use of these products may be a benefit to their health or risk to their health. So just from a, from a retailer's perspective and from the lounges, um, you know, because, uh, as is noted before, the, the use and frequency is, is so is, it's not really regular. And again, the vast majority of the customers that are coming into lounges or purchasing these, they're purchasing them for once or twice or maybe three times a year um, or celebration of, of some sort of life event. And, and so I don't know if that necessarily often enters into their preview when they're looking at this because they're looking at it as a one-off as opposed to something that is creating some sort of dependency and, and, and a habit on, on something like this. Um, and so uh, at least in this terms and in this regard for from the retailer to the consumer aspect of it, uh, it's not necessarily front of mind because the use and purchases are so infrequent. Mr. Shavitz. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve, Dr. Torres, thank you. Uh, first, um, I'm Barry Shavitz, I'm an attorney in New York. Uh, I am here because I work with the Cigar Association of America, uh, CA, uh, one of the leading industry trade associations, as well as the four uh, largest uh, premium cigar manufacturers uh, that are our CA members. And those companies together make up uh, somewhere uh, above 50% of the premium cigars uh, sold in the United States. Um, if I could, and I will be brief, uh, a few comments that I'd like to uh, make first on the definition. Um, yes, there is no federal regulatory definition of premium cigar. Um, a point that uh, Dr. Appleberg made a couple of weeks ago or last month when he addressed the committee. The reason there's no federal regulatory definition of premium cigar is because as a matter of process, the agency has to go through um, a procedure, a process for uh, coming up with a definition that hasn't been done. The definition that uh, that uh, Dr. Appleberg referred to, the definition that uh, Judge Mehta adopted, the one that you've heard about, um, was adopted in a federal litigation, right? It is not a definition that's gone through the process by which definitions need to be adopted. I like, I'll make this point though. Most of the definitions that are out there, FDA itself has put out three different definitions, proposed definitions of premium cigar. The industry doesn't have a common definition of premium cigar. Uh, as Dr. Ashley and I think um, uh, Mike Cummings mentioned, you go online and there are other ways of defining a premium score. Most of the definitions have certain core criteria that all premium scores meet. But my, my point is this, and I, I agree with what Dr. Appleberg said, FDA is not looking for this committee to come up with a definition of premium cigar. Right? To come up with a definition for federal regulatory purposes requires a process. But, and here's the key point, once the committee looks at all the scientific literature, once it looks at the NERA analysis of the PATH data, once it looks at the e-consult data from online sales, what you're going to realize is that the diff slight differences in the definition don't really matter when it comes to the conclusions on issues that the committee is looking at. Youth usage is so low as to be immeasurable regardless of the definition. Second, health effects for most premium cigar users are not adverse health effects are not increased by use of premium cigar for most premium cigar smokers. And that is 95% or so. So I, I, I suggest that the committee not get bogged down on trying to come up with a definition, but rather look at the scientific literature, look at the data that we've presented, that will be presented to you, that you'll find on your own and let FDA, leave it to FDA to come up with a definition using the process that they are supposed to use, that they're legally uh, required to use. Uh, that's one point. Second, um, I'm going to ask you to be real brief because we want to get a couple of others in. Sorry to, we're, we're just running way behind. 
I understand, real brief. Uh, in response to two questions. First, uh, Neil, uh, Dr. Benowitz, on your question on uh, verification, right? I suggest that whether or not a cigar is premium is subject to verification first by the manufacturer. That's the way it's done in other industries, regulated by FDA. It's done that way in the device industry. It's also done that way in the tobacco industry. Self-certification as an initial step subject to agency verification. Second, Professor Donevo, you asked a question last time about the size of the premium cigar space and where the data comes from. Um, uh, uh, my friend uh, Drew Newman and uh, Josh Haberski both mentioned the Cigar Association. That data comes from TTB data uh, collected through looking at the harmonized tariff schedules. There is no definition of premium cigar, so we do the best we can to collect information on the highest tariff categories, right? Those are the premium cigars, and then we extrapolate slightly but we're confident that the size of the premium cigar industry is roughly two and a half, three percent of the overall cigar category. In absolute numbers, what does that mean? It means that of 13 billion cigars or thereabout uh, imported into the United States, somewhere around 320, 350 million can be classified as premium. And with that, Steve, I apologize for taking so long and I'll stop. Great. Thank you so much, um, uh, Chris, and then Mache, and then we'll probably have to cut it off. Go ahead, Chris. Sure. Um, I have a question that is prompted by um, Mr. Lingard and Mr. Wong's presentation, but the question is not necessarily um, for them. There are certainly challenges with product testing given the extreme heterogeneity of the premium cigar market. Um, but with respect to figuring out the health effects, um, the individual variation may be, while important, needs to also be balanced in the context of market share. Um, so I'm gonna throw this open as a question and not necessarily ask for an answer right now, but if you have data, I would encourage you to submit it, what the market share looks like for the leading brands of premium cigars in the United States, which would be very useful. Thank you. Yes, and yes, uh, everyone, of course, is free to submit uh, information to, into our public record. Uh, uh, and just FYI, that information uh, uh, can be made public, but uh, we welcome all those kind of submissions. Mache. Yeah, just a good comment and just, a, you know, clarification. I'm, I'm, I'm toxicologist, I'm pharmacologist, and I, the question that I want to ask is, is not related to my field of expertise, but we, today we try to understand the industry and user patterns of use. So what, as I listen to your presentation, and thank you so much, it's very informative. On the one hand, I hear that the use pattern is very irregular, very rare, the prevalence is low. On the other hand, I hear that you imported 13 billions of cigars and you're making a lot of products in, in the country. You know, how is your business model? I, I, on, on one hand, you're telling us that the users are using it so rarely and they're buying it very rarely. On the other hand, I, I understand the industry is, is powerful and you make money. I, I, I just don't understand how it, what, what is your business model? If you can just explain to me, like person who is not in a market analysis. Maybe Drew, that's a Drew? question for you. Sure, that's a great question. I would say that premium cigars are, are unique in the sense that there's a very low barrier to entry. When you're using your hands, you don't need expensive machines or equipment or capital investment. And so in our industry, there are dozens, if not hundreds of small premium cigar companies that can go to a, 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 a wholesaler and, and buy tobacco and roll cigars with their own hands and then sell it uh, on the U.S. market or or, or elsewhere. And, and 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 while there are a few larger companies in our space, the I would put forth that the the vast majority of cigars are sold in the United States. Our premium cigars are sold by by smaller family-owned companies like ours. And uh, I think we all agree that there's about 350 million premium cigars sold in the United States every year, and that number has been fairly consistent, at least over the last five to two, uh, 10 years. Um, when you think about the population, the adult population of our country and the, 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 the billions of units of cigarettes and cigarillos and other cigars sold, so the premium cigar industry is still very small. And uh, we do have market share data that is out there and we can happy to, to submit it uh, in response to the prior question. 
Great. Well, thanks to um, all of our speakers and uh, um, uh, your responses also to the q and I'm sorry we, we didn't have more time to dive into many of these other issues. Um, by the way, Chris, we'll be able to uh, query you offline um, as the committee has questions. Uh, with that, why don't we take a, uh, uh, the 15 minute break that we anticipated and uh, come back at uh, 25 to the hour. Thanks everyone. Well, welcome back everyone. Hopefully you were able to stretch a little uh, because we have a very interesting panel to wind up our day. Um, and it's going to focus on tobacco control and policy perspectives. Um, our panelists are Anne Boonen, who's the Director of Research at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and Dr. Barbara Schillo, who's Senior VP at uh, Truth Initiative Schroeder Institute, uh, as well as Joel uh, Lester, who's the Director of Commercial Tobacco Control Programs at the Public Health Law Center at the uh, Mitchell Hamline School of Law. Uh, joining us uh, for the Q&A will be uh, Dennis Hennigan, who's the Vice President for Legal and Regulatory Affairs at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. So uh, that's a great line uh, lineup. And we're going to start with uh, with you, Ann. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for, um, for uh, the opportunity to speak today. I'm Ann Boone, Director of Research at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. The campaign is the nation's largest nonprofit, non-governmental advocacy organization solely devoted to reducing tobacco use and its deadly toll. The Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids receives funding for its overall work from a variety of sources, including individual donors, private foundations such as Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, corporations such as CVS Health, and major public health organizations such as the American Cancer Society. The campaign does not accept any direct or indirect funding from the tobacco industry. The campaign regularly participates in the FDA regulatory process and has filed formal comments supporting FDA regulation of all cigars, including so-called premium cigars. And we have also appeared in court proceedings as a friend of the court, again, supporting FDA regulation of all cigars. I'll be sharing the campaign's views on premium cigars, including considerations on a potential definition and providing some thoughts on the proposed research questions for the committee. The work that the committee is doing is critically important because the findings from the report will likely be used in a number of ways. It will likely inform not only FDA's regulatory decisions, but could also impact state and local policy work as well. There are ongoing court proceedings in which the industry is challenging FDA's authority to regulate premium cigars, and FDA has been mandated by court order to consider streamlined substantial equivalence product review process for premium cigars. In addition, some states have considered differential policy making for premium cigars as compared to other tobacco products. And the committee's work could be used as a scientific basis to either support or counter such efforts. I also want to provide a different framing from what you may have heard before about why we're here and why FDA and NIH brought this committee together. The committee was formed to evaluate the health effects of premium cigars, not to discuss how they're artisan handcrafted products or that they've been around for centuries, but to discuss the but to, to discuss the health harms that these tobacco products cause to users and non-users. Premium cigars, like all other cigars, are highly addictive products that increase the risk of death and disease for smokers and non-smokers exposed to secondhand smoke. All premium cigars contain and deliver to their users the same toxins and carcinogens as other cigars and cigarettes, including nicotine, a highly addictive substance. Cigars can cause multiple kinds of cancer and a variety of other fatal diseases. Secondhand tobacco smoke causes death and disease to non-users of tobacco products, and smoke from premium cigars is no less likely, likely to contribute to such serious health consequences than is smoke from any other combustible tobacco product. FDA has already concluded based on the evidence that regardless of the type of cigar smoked, quote, all cigars produce secondhand smoke, which causes negative health effects such as heart disease and lung cancer in bystanders, unquote. And the Surgeon General in 2006 stated, quote, there's no risk-free level of secondhand smoke exposure, even with brief exposure adversely affecting the cardiovascular and respiratory systems, unquote. Given that the types of cigars we're talking about today tend to be larger than, much larger than cigarettes, the volume of smoke and the amount of toxicants released in a given smoking session is higher, as shown by Dr. Cummings earlier today. It is possible to imagine, it is impossible to imagine that even a premium cigar smoker who claims not to inhale the smoke from the cigar, being able to inv avoid inhaling the secondhand smoke released by the cigar. The committee has developed a comprehensive list of potential research questions that could be considered. 
In the realm of science and health, more research can always be, it can always serve to fill uh, gaps in our knowledge. I think that it's important to recognize, however, that although there might not be complete answers to the exact questions being posed, that doesn't mean the conclusions can't be drawn from the information already available. Based on what we already know about premium cigars, despite what the industry repeatedly says, premium cigars are not an entirely different category of combustible tobacco product. They are just a variation of, com of, a combust of combustible tobacco cigars that regardless of how they are used, still raise serious health risks. There's already sufficient research at this time to establish that premium cigars, like all cigars, should be regulated. In approaching, pro in approaching the issue of defining premium cigars, it is legitimate to ask the question, for what purpose is this term being defined? If it is for the purpose of defining a distinct category of cigars that, because of their characteristics, should be subject to lesser regulation than other cigars, we believe the task of defining premium cigars to be fundamentally flawed because that distinct category does not exist. In addition, I think everyone on this committee can agree that it is impossible to draw a clear line between those products that claim to be premium cigars and those that aren't. For example, Kozowski et al. found that weights of large cigars and cigarillo products varied greatly and weren't necessarily consistent with the labeled product type. And some products called cigarillos weighed more than products called large cigars. This has implications for health risks since they also found that the nicotine content was not necessarily associated with the size of the cigar and determined which products uh, sorry, and determining which products might deliver more nicotine than others is not an intuitive process. And you've heard several times today that even the cigar industry does not agree on a definition. If, however, there is to be an effort to define premium cigars for regulatory purposes, we believe one of the most important elements to include in a definition is a high minimum retail price point after any discounts may be applied. And several people today have already mentioned the FDA's working definition um, of premium cigars with those eight criteria. Because it is much more specific, the definition is an improvement from what FDA had included in its 2014 pr proposed deeming rule with one big exception. This definition lacks a minimum price point, which had been set at $10 per cigar in the 2014 deeming rule. If a definition of premium cigars is to be stipulated in an effort to subject a category to a lesser degree of re regulation, a high minimum price point has the lowest risk of industry manipulation and may be the most important in ensuring that premium cigars are not used by youth. The cigar industry itself has defined premium cigars by reference to the $10 price point. In comments that Cigar International Incorporated and other cigar interests filed with FDA, they stated, quote, premium cigars often sell for $10 or more, unquote. In fact, given that it is seven years since the $10 price point was proposed, we would support an even higher minimum price floor that is indexed for inflation. The imp importance of a price point is underscored by some products available on the market that are cheap and could fall under the premium cigar definition. For instance, game leaf cigars, which retail at $2 for $1.49, are described as natural rolled leaf cigars. According to its manufacturer, Swedish Match North America, quote, a rolled leaf cigar is where both the internal and external components are rolled together by hand, unquote. The outer leaf certainly looks like a cut of whole leaf tobacco. And when we weighed some, uh, some of these products in the office, they were on average 6.4 pounds per thousand. While they're available in various flavors, there's no doubt that the manufacturer would claim that the one called natural is not a characterizing flavor in order to fit into the premium cigar definition. I don't have information about the filler or the ingredients, but even if they do not currently fit those aspects of the definition, changes could be made to enable this cheap cigar to qualify as a premium cigar. Also, any definition for premium cigars must specify that they cannot have characterizing flavors. Not doing so would make these products especially appealing to the youth market. Premium cigar makers may claim their products do not currently have characterizing flavors. So if they're unfettered by regulation and the stipulation isn't included, what is to stop them from changing their products to add flavors? That ability to change product composition is an important danger of setting such definitions. As many of the committee members are well aware, um, previous attempts to draw clear-cut lines to differentiate between cigar products has, have resulted in, in the industry manipulating their products to evade policies that are meant to protect public health. Small cigars became so-called large filtered cigars almost overnight to avoid paying the higher federal tax, and cigarettes became cigars almost immediately to circumvent uh, FDA's ban on cigar cigarettes with characterizing flavors. Thus, any definition could become an instruction manual on how to change products to avoid regulation. Making the definition as narrow and as detailed as possible, as well as including a high price floor, will help to minimize the issue. 
The campaign will be submitting more detailed written comments on the proposed research questions, but I wanted to highlight some of the ones that we think are most important for the committee to consider. The cigar industry repeatedly, repeatedly states that regulation of premium cigars is unnecessary because they claim that few youth use premium cigars and adults only use premium cigars infrequently. The committee has been asked to evaluate patterns of use and we agree that it's critical to have information on these issues. However, even if those questions cannot be answered with scientific precision and certainty, that does not mean premium cigars should escape regulation. FDA concluded in the Demi rule that youth and young adults use premium cigars and explained that it is most concerned by youth and young adult use of these products because of their unique susceptibility to nicotine addiction. The question about perceptions of risk of premium cigars compared to other tobacco products is also critical. In its final Demi rule, FDA presented evidence that people already mistakenly believe that cigars generally are less harmful than cigarettes and raised the concern that, quote, an exemption could mislead consumers to believe that premium cigars are safe, which contradicts the available evidence that all cigars are harmful and potentially addictive, unquote. If the lines between cigar products are already blurred, how would a premium cigar exemption exempt affect consumer perceptions of cigars generally? This also raises the question of the risks of not regulating premium cigars. Could this lead to changes in patterns of use, including who uses the products and even changes in the products themselves? I know that the committee is not charged with determining regulatory policy, but the committee's report will influence regulatory decisions that in turn could affect the use and the public health impact of premium cigars. One large gap in the research being proposed is data on the cigar market, particularly the premium cigar market. For instance, how does the cigar market break down into the different categories by sales? What is the range in prices of premium cigars? What price points are the most common? And what are the types of discounts that we see on premium cigars? What types of stores sell premium cigars, including online? And where are most of those sales? These questions about the cigar market are relevant to show where and how consumers get premium cigars that go beyond just the demographics of, cigars, of cigar users. For instance, although cigar makers have said that their products are sold in specialty stores, some cigar companies have been trying to push their products into convenience stores. A representative from the Scandinavian Tobacco Company stated that convenience stores are, quote, a fast growing alternative tobacco's profit stream potential, thanks to, the, thanks to innovation in, in packaging, unquote, and that the novel packaging would, quote, entice the occasional premium cigar smoker, typically younger generation consumers, unquote. Scandinavian Tobacco Company claims on its website to be the number one in the US for handmade cigars. The industry strategy of introducing premium cigars into convenience stores is especially concerning because nearly half of adolescents in the US visit a convenience store at least a week, once a week, and 58% of high schoolers who said they purchased tobacco products themselves in the past 30 days said they got them from, from gas stations or convenience stores. In addition, there are other ways that cigar companies are getting their products into the viewing range of younger people. So it's important for the committee Excuse me. <clears throat> it's important for the committee to consider current but also potential marketing strategies by the cigar industry. As an example, Nick Jonas of the Jonas Brothers graced the cover of the September-October 2019 issue of Cigar Aficionado. At that time, he was 26 years old and the youngest person ever to be featured holding a cigar on the cover of the magazine. The feature article noted that Jonas is a, quote, teen idol, unquote, and stated that Jonas began using premium cigars at 18 years old but was surrounded by cigar smokers prior to that, which piqued his interest. In the article, Jonas stated, quote, one of the things a lot of people say to me is, you're so young to like cigars. It is a narrative that I'm aware of and actually something that I love being able to speak to. It, I think that cigars as a whole should be something that you should share with friends and there shouldn't be any barriers around who can enjoy them. And no matter your age, you should be able to enjoy the process, unquote. On Twitter, Cigar Aficionado pointed out that Jonas's Instagram posts of pictures from the issue had been liked 1.2 million times, and quote, no other cover has ever drawn such attention on social media, unquote. These examples of industry marketing and advertising demonstrate that it's not only important to address youth use and patterns, but also the comprehensive monitoring of the cigar landscape and marketing is critical to ensure that youth are given the maximum protection. To conclude, I'd like to reiterate that while more research would be helpful for certain purposes, there's already plenty of evidence to show that premium cigars should not be seen as a separate and distinct category of combustible tobacco products for purposes of regulatory policy, because all cigars pose health risks. Any attempt to differentiate between premium cigars and other cigars would likely lead to industry manipulation to qualify for more favorable treatment. But if FDA nevertheless seeks to create a separate category for premium cigars for lesser regulatory treatment, 
it is vital that a high pre minimum price point be included in the definition, as well as the other criteria already being used by FDA. The committee's findings will have implications beyond just FDA regulation. There certainly are questions that the committee could, should and could look into, but existing data are not only still valid and relevant, but quite sufficient to support regulatory and policy decisions being made now. Thank you. Thank you, that was uh, very helpful. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Schillo. Thank you. You're up. Um, uh, you're gonna put my slides up for me. Um, I can get started in the meantime. Yes, that'd be great. They're about to come. So good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Barbara Schillo. I'm a senior vice president at the Schroeder Institute of the Truth Initiative. In my role at Truth, I lead a team of research scientists to investigate the impact of tobacco related policies on youth and young adults. My current research portfolio is funded entirely by Truth Initiative. Um, Truth Initiative is America's largest nonprofit public health organization. It's okay, you are in the right place. Go ahead, one more. There we go. Um, Truth Initiative, America's largest non nonprofit public health organization dedicated to a future where tobacco and a nicotine addiction are things of the past. We do our work through education for youth and young adults, tobacco control research and policy study, community activism and engagement, and digital cessation programs. Next slide. So I'm gonna focus on youth and young adults. So let me start with Truth's view on premium cigars. We know that cigars, no matter the size or price, are addictive and deadly combustible products. A robust and sound body of evidence tells us that they are highly toxic, deliver large amounts of nicotine, which we know is especially harmful to the developing adolescent brain, and that counter to perceptions, premium cigars are used by youth and young adults. On this slide, we see the data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which tells us that past 30 day cigar use, and it's all, all cigar use, um, among high school students and middle school students is now similar to cigarette use. Next slide, please. But if we start to dig a little deeper and look at the 2020 data for monitoring the future, we see um, use patterns specifically for um, uh, uh, cigars um, by types, including large cigars. So 1.5% of eighth graders, 1.2% of 10th graders reported past 30 day use of large cigars. And when you add in use among young adults, the number of youth exposed to the harmfulness of premium cigars cannot be simply dismissed. We know from a recent study, in fact, looking at PATH data from 2013 to 2017, that youth are susceptible to traditional cigar use as they get older. This study found that between the ages of 15 and 18, there was a 21% increase in those who became susceptible to the use of cigars. Increases in the probability of initiation of ever and past 30 day cigar use, including traditional cigars, continue to rise as these youth continued their transition into young adulthood. And we also have evidence that young people of color are disproportionately impacted. A new study using again PATH data presented in the graph on the right hand of this slide shows that black non-Hispanics and Hispanics have more advanced patterns of cigar smoking than white non-Hispanics. And we pulled out the traditional cigars um, for this category. Next slide, please. At Truth, we also care about premium cigars because we know they are marketed to youth and young people. Celebrity endorsements of cigar products are particularly troubling. A study from Sterling et al. showed that the odds of small cigar smoking susceptibility increased threefold for those who reported exposure to a celebrity endorsement compared to those not exposed. And while this study focused on small cigars, I'm gonna talk later in my presentation on the need for further research that looks specifically at the impact of marketing of large cigars to young people. Next slide. I don't need to uh, spend a lot of time here. Um, my a colleague, Ann Boone, um, mentioned the Nick Jonas um, example, um, and I'll just give you a chance to, to see it. Um, uh, you know, again, this is a clear example of celebrity endorsement um, that appeared in the September, October, 2019 issue of Cigar Aficionado. So next slide. So with that background on Truth's view on premium cigars, I'm now gonna offer comments on defining premium cigars and then our thoughts on the committee's proposed research questions. Next slide. At Truth, we recognize that large or premium cigars are largely a marketing construct from the industry. There is variability in what gets included in this large cigar construct. This is the same slide that we saw earlier by Dr. Cummings. 
Um, and we know that attempts to differentiate between cigar products for regulatory purposes make them vulnerable to industry manipulation. Indeed, the industry is engaged in a well-established pattern of exploiting regulatory loopholes to avoid regulation. And you know, I too was going to point to the Kozowski et al. study um, on weights of large cigars and cigarillo products, which showed great variation um, and that Anne um, mentioned in her testimony. Next slide. Again, truth does not endorse a definition of premium cigars. However, if there is to be an effort to define premium cigars for regulatory purposes, then we urge caution in the inclusion of required defining elements. Most of what you've heard today, specifying a price, um, handmade, hand rolled, use of whole leaf tobacco, specifying a weight, and uh, no characterizing flavors other than tobacco. And I also want to note as a scientist that any definition needs to evolve as the products evolve. We've learned in this landscape of rapidly changing tobacco products that we want to be sure that we're investigating the impact of the latest generation of cigars on young people, not previous generations of these products. Next slide. So now on to the preliminary research questions. I do want to state, much like Anne did in her remarks, that our, it's our view that FDA really already has the data it needs to regulate all cigar products. We already know a significant amount about cigar use and its impact on the body. All data indicates there's no safe use of cigars. And because of the health effects to youth, young adults, and adult users, they do impact public health and therefore need regulation. That said, I want to highlight some of the research areas, including additional areas not included on the list, that we think are most important for the committee to consider. In terms of patterns of use, we see a need for research to address where and how youth obtain cigars and how this changes over time. We believe it's important using both self-reported use and retail sales data to monitor use among youth and young adults and to look specifically in probe on aspects of co-use, use with marijuana and risk trajectories for future use of other tobacco products. We believe it's important to monitor the introduction of new cigar products on the market, what appeals to youth and how is this reflected in sales. And uh, like Anne said as well, we believe it's important for us to understand where most of the sales are happening. In terms of consumer perceptions, we believe it's important to further investigate how youth perceive and understand the risks of cigar use. We know this is especially important given that youth and particularly African-American youth may perceive cigars more favorably than cigarettes and consider cigars more natural, less harmful, cheaper and better smelling than cigarettes. And we also recognize this last bullet on this slide, the critical importance of research on the impacts of tobacco control policies applied to cigars and their understanding their impacts on patterns of use. Next slide. Case in point is you know, under, our understanding now the impact of the federal tax disparity. Anne mentioned this, I'll just call out you know, what most of us know is that in 2009, when the federal excise tax on little cigars increased from four cents to $1 per pack of 20, it brought the tax rate on little cigars up to par with cigarettes. This made large cigars the cheaper alternative to cigarettes um, and this differential was essentially taken advantage of by small cigar manufacturers who increased the weights of their products slightly in order to qualify as large cigars and thus make their products significantly cheaper. Um, as a result, large cigar consumption increased substantially, when you, which you can see illustrated in this graph on the sale of small and large cigars in the US. Next slide, please. There are numerous policy aspects today that are important for us to understand um, in, uh, with respect to large cigars that should be examined through more research. Are there point of sale policies that could be effective in preventing youth use of cig cigars? Uh, you know, Anne referenced, you know, the fact that we have some evidence that the premium cigar industry is working to introduce their products into convenience stores. Um, I won't uh, repeat that. I think what she entered into her comments uh, is critical. Um, and we know that the retail outlet has been one of the least regulated venues for tobacco marketing and promotion. And cigars are certainly no except, um, exception. Um, we believe it's important to look at what impact coupons and discounts have on youth use in particular. We know one of the ways the cigar industry promotes its products is through direct to consumer marketing. Um, most of these ads come through the mail, contain at least one promotion, which may appeal to price sensitive populations, which we know youth are. And finally, from a policy perspective, we also need to know what price sensitivity looks like for youth and young adults for cigar products. 
What are effective minimum prices, for example, for youth prevention? Next slide, please. So now I wanna talk a little bit more about marketing, which again, my colleague Ann Boone mentioned. Again, there is a real need here for research and monitoring on the marketing of large cigars and particularly uh, uh, with respect to celebrity endorsements, but also in respect to, with respect to social media influencers. Next slide, please. So a, a real need for a focus on research on influencer marketing, a, a, a very recent study, a 2020 content analysis of Instagram ads promoting cigars by Navarro et al. found that cigar brands commonly use influencers to market their products on brand Instagram pages. Most influencers had large follower counts and worked in the hip hop industry. And these influencers modeled cigar use in the post. Next slide. In addition to celebrity endorsements and social influencers, there's also a need for research that monitors how market is e marketing is evolving. And I've included this slide here as just an example of the types of concepts that we see um, around cigar products that are appealing to, being used to appeal to youth and subculture and individualism. So this is kind of a new um, marketing tactic, sort of moving away from the traditional concepts of luxury um, associated with premium cigars. And I just point to this as an example of how marketing continues to evolve and research to understand that and its impact on youth and young adults is critical. Next slide, please. Again, in terms of health effects, we note that the fact that some cigar smokers might smoke such products infrequently or report that they do not inhale does not negate the adverse effects of tobacco of cigar smoke or demonstrate that cigars do not cause secondhand smoke related disease in others. In terms of research, we see the need to further understand how are youth and young adults using cigars? Are they exposing um, others or how are they exposing themselves? In terms of abuse liability, given the addiction potential of large cigars and the high nicotine content and the particular relevance of nicotine exposure to young people, there is a need to examine abuse liability specifically among youth and young adults. And finally, on the measurement side of things, I think that we've made a lot of advancements in being able to measure um, self-reported use um, among youth and young adults of different types of products. And we need additional research so that we're ensuring that high quality research where youth and young adults are accurately reporting what types of cigar types and brands are using is being done. Next slide. So um, in conclusion, um, I'll just say a few points just to sum it up here. Cigars are not safe and have a negative impact on youth and young adults. Infrequent use, and again, reports of not inhaling, do not negate the adverse effects. Consumers believe cigar smoking to be less harmful and more socially acceptable than cigarette smoking. And we feel that some youth, uh, that youth and some youth groups are particularly um, vulnerable to these misperceptions. Future research should advance evidence um, should advance evidence based and common sense regulations, including restrictions on marketing to youth and product standards that reduce appeal, toxicity, and addictiveness. And finally, the cigar industry markets cigar products using the same strategies for marketing cigars. Research into these strategies to inform regulation is needed. So just last slide, um, I'll just say Truth Initiative will as well be submitting more detailed written comments on the topics I've addressed. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this information and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, now we'll turn to Ms. Lester. Hello, thanks so much for having me today. My name is Joelle Lester. I'm the Director of Commercial Tobacco Control Programs at the Public Health Law Center, as Steve mentioned. Um, we are a national legal center uh, providing technical assistance to support policy change that protects health in the tobacco space. That means um, policy change at all levels of government to protect communities from the harms of tobacco use, of commercial tobacco use, distinguishing that from the sacred use of traditional tobacco. Um, so I'm going to be um, echoing some of the themes of our partners at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and the Truth Initiative. Oh, I should mention, um, like the campaign, we have a variety of funding sources, um, primarily from government contracts with health departments and also um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is funding my work here today. So our perspective on this issue is as folks who try to help community advocates and public health professionals design policies to best address 
the problems that they're seeing in their communities caused by tobacco use. And, um, and so that perspective is really informed by the challenges posed both by um, designing a policy that clearly communicates to the public um, the information that it needs to know about what a, the restriction um, applies to and does and it communicates clearly to the retailers, um, but that also effectively captures the products you're trying to capture to restrain industry behavior. Um, and then also um, that can be um, effectively both interpreted, impl um, implemented, enforced, and upheld at litigation. Um, I also want to mention that, you know, centering equity in all of our work is a priority for the Public Health Law Center, and we'll, that perspective extends to the work that happens at the FDA and our desire to see the FDA consider impacts on um, traditionally and historically marginalized communities when it does everything from its research um, to its um, regulatory processes and pre-market review. So as a sort of a threshold matter, um, I strongly agree with um, my partners, Anne and Barbara, and I'm sure Denny, when he um, chimes in, that um, all combustible tobacco products should be regulated by the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. To um, decline to do so, and I, I, we view this as sort of a settled issue after the finalization of the um, deeming rule in 2016, when the FDA made specific conclusions about the health risks associated with all cigars um, and, um, we, I would also just add that to exclude the products from regulation would um, uh, decline to extend any protections to the users, including just information disclosure, health warnings that the users have a right to see. But it also would mean that the Center for Tobacco Products would not be collecting the information that would allow us to keep track of changes to the product category, which Barbara rightly pointed out is incredibly important. So when you take something sort of out of the purview of the Center for Tobacco Products, you don't keep track of that problem as it evolves and it's extremely problematic. Um, and then our, our primary um, concern about um, the, the premium cigar issue is how to define it. So just sort of assuming that um, the FDA is going to regulate the products, um, the, what we have seen time and again at all levels of regulation of tobacco products is that exemptions cause problems and differential treatment causes problems. And those problems happen both from the industry response also from changes in patterns of use as other um, more restrictive policies go into place for other products. It can drive users to change products um, in ways that your, the prior research did not exist. The problems uh, indicate the problems to be. Um, and then I think um, the um, exemptions can also drive disparities depending on how the evolution of how products are marketed and sold to particular communities. So generally speaking, comprehensive regulation of tobacco products best protects health and making decisions that are appropriate for the public health, as you know, is the charge to the FDA Center for Tobacco Products from Congress. So um, I just want to tell, share a little more detail about um, the examples of how this has gone badly for public health in the past that Anne touched on in her remarks. In 2009, there were two laws that passed um, seeking to protect health related to tobacco products. As you know, obviously, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which included stringent restrictions on the manufacture and sale of cigarettes, prohibited flavors other than menthol and tobacco in cigarettes. Um, it prohibited the use of modified risk terms, including light and low tar. It imposed significant advertising and marketing restrictions, but deferred any regulation of any cigars, including premium cigars for the future. At this, uh, the same time or the same year, the Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act was passed, which increased federal excise taxes on all tobacco products, but did not increase taxes equitably, so it left the tax on cigars lower than the tax on cigarettes. And the industry response to these restrictions, I think, is instructive. Manufacturers of discount cigarettes modified their products to convert them into cigars for regulatory and taxation purposes. They added a nominal amount of tobacco to their paper wrappers. Manufacturers of roll your own tobacco simply change the labeling on their products to pipe tobacco, uh, a product not immediately subject to FDA authority and taxed at a lower rate than roll your own. And cigar manufacturers converted small cigars to large cigars by adding um, an ingredient to increase cigar weight and moving the products into a more favorable tax category. So with that one change, cigar companies were able to avoid over $1 billion in taxes in the first four years following CHIPRA. 
So the, the lesson here, and um, I understand, and I'm, I'm sure that there are comments coming in about what I, whether what I'm saying applies to premium versus other cigars, but the lesson here is that the tobacco industry responds by moving. And so what we what you might think is a premium cigar now will not necessarily be a pre, what the premium cigar category looks like after regulations are imposed. And it's, it, we can't ignore that. It isn't... Um, um, it's, it's not something that we can't uh, anticipate for. Um, and so it, I think it's fair to look at these patterns of practice. Uh, so any, any sort of differential regulation can create an economic incentive to exploit the loophole. And the result of the exploitation is that the use of the product categories that were not subject to the most stringent regulation or taxation went up as consumers moved to less expensive and less stringently regulated products. Um, so I think this gets at some of the points also that Anne was making about if there is going to be a different category of premium cigar, we can learn from past practices to ensure that that category is as narrow as possible um, and restricted to the kinds of products that uh, if they are demonstrated to have um, less, less harm to the community and, um, in terms of initiation and use patterns and cessation. Um, I just want to point out that this is a broader issue with uh, to the tobacco industry is not limited to the cigar category. Um, we've seen this at the state and local level as well when there are um, limitations on regulation. For example, in the state of Minnesota was um, um, applying its taxes to e-cigarettes um, under its definition of tobacco products, um, the first state to do so. The nicotine had to be derived from tobacco and, and there was a um, e-cigarette company that claimed that its nicotine came from eggplants and tomatoes. Um, and so I think, you know, so anytime that there is a distinction in the category, um, somebody is going to try to exploit it. Um, there are ongoing challenges with implementing and enforcing flavored tobacco product sales restrictions at the local level where the tobacco industry argues whether or not it's actually flavored, um, saying that, um, that they can't taste the citrus in um, Black and mild jazz, for example, and all of these kinds of things complicate and delay enforcement and result in litigation. So I cannot stress to enough how important just definitions are and um, how much time we spend trying to think through definitions that communicate clearly um, and also avoid tobacco industry manipulation in response. Another thing to consider when you are considering um, the elements, I mean, I was looking at some of the um, proposed elements of a definition for a premium cigar, and I think it's important to consider who determines which products meet the definitions, given the history of tobacco industry efforts to avoid restriction, what information is required to achieve that um, distinction or definition, who provides the information, and who verifies that information. Something we've seen at the FDA has been a uh, what we would say, characterize as an over-reliance on tobacco industry submissions without verification. And um, given that the tobacco industry has a well-documented and well-litigated practice of dishonesty over the health harms of its products, it's uh, unwise to set up a structure where it's hard to uh, identify whether a product should qualify um, for a particular definition and therefore be exempt um, from any regulation or subject to less Regarding the um, research questions, um, just a couple of suggestions uh, for additional consideration. Um, environmental impacts of tobacco product production and disposal should be considered um, as part of the health harms and environmental justice impact of the tobacco product and could be um, considered in this context as well. I think something that we've learned, um, especially in the um, jewel type e-cigarette situation is um, how significant the environmental and health impacts can be from production and disposal. And um, it should be part of the FDA's consideration on this issue. Um, marketing and advertising patterns, as Barbara pointed out, are critically important and can also be um, instructive about uh, in forecasting um, patterns of use that will change um, if it's subject to different restrictions than other tobacco products. Um, and I think targeted marketing in specific racial, ethnic, and geographic groups, including price and promotions, price promotions and discounting are critical, as well as use patterns by racial, ethnic, LGBTQ, and geographic groups are important. I think that um, it's important to ask those questions at the research phase so that FDA can make um, good regulatory decisions um, that 
don't continue to drive health disparities, um, but rather take that information into account and try to advance equity in its treatment of all tobacco products. So I will give it back to you, Steve. Great. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to all of our speakers. So uh, we just have a quarter of an hour or so um, to uh, for Q&As, and we're joined by uh, uh, Mr. Hennigan as well. So uh, floor is open to queries from the uh, from the committee. And if there are none from there, we can also take some from the uh, unseen audience. I think uh, if you can raise your hand, I believe that colleagues at uh, at the academies can unmute you. Actually, Steve, um, we had that for the last meeting because it was a public comment um, meeting. But here, individuals can type their questions into the chat and then okay. we can read them out loud. So we can give folks a moment to do that. Um, I, I think, so, um, oh. oh. So Mr. Shavitz? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Amy, if you want to continue. I was just gonna call on you. I think we had a few statements that I think you were going to represent, or well, to, I should say. Uh, since, uh, Steve, since there were no um, questions from the committee members, if I could just offer a couple of observations and some comments. Um, first, um, to the extent that um, that uh, that uh, that you know, Barbara and Anne are advocating for evidence-based, science-based, fact-based regulation, I agree. And the materials that we've submitted to the committee so far support the view that premium cigars are different, that they ought to be regulated differently, that they don't raise youth usage issues. The facts, the science the evidence about premium cigars should not be conflated with any other tobacco products, right? The evidence has to be based on premium cigars. And the evidence is youth usage is so low as to be almost unmeasurable. The evidence is that it's used, premium cigars are usually, generally, overwhelmingly used so infrequently as to not pose any additional health risks. It, the, the issue is not the product itself. The issue has to be the usage patterns. That's what the committee needs to be looking at. Uh, that's one observation. The second one is um, with respect to the comment about um, Scandinavian Tobacco Group and marketing to convenience stores. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that attachment in the amicus brief that uh, the group filed in the litigation last week. Um, it's a reference to, a, uh, a, I think, a newspaper article from about three years ago. Um, premium cigar sales in convenience stores represent a fraction of a fraction of the overall market to point to that as, uh, as a public health problem uh, is misleading at best. And that's something that um, we're pleased to discuss further uh, at the next meeting of, um, uh, of the committee. So um, with that, you know, I, 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 I come back to the, the point about the definition. Um, there are a number of definitions, you know, Barbara and Ann uh, pointed that out as well. The issue is what the science and the data say right now. And the science, the data are pretty clear about premium cigars, regardless of how they're defined and there are nuances and how they might be defined. The definition though, again, is up to the agency to pursue through notice and rulemaking. There isn't comment rulemaking. That's the way the process is supposed to work. So um, comments from our presenters. Yeah, Mr. Hennigan, go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. and. Uh, my name is Dennis Hennigan. I'm vice president for legal and regulatory affairs at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Um, and I'll just incorporate by reference um, uh, the disclosures by Ann Boone, because we work for the same group. Um, but thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate uh, in this meeting uh, as a discussant. Um, and um, I guess I'd like to make um, one very important point, uh, specifically in response to uh, Mr. Shavitz's uh, uh, comments. And that is that it really is important for this committee to understand the regulatory context in which it is approaching these issues. Um, in rulemaking proceedings leading to the deeming rule uh, in which FDA 
uh, determined that the science supports extending its jurisdiction to all cigars, including so-called premium cigars. And in a legal battle that has been ex going on for three years and goes on to this day, the cigar industry is seeking a complete exemption from regulation for these so-called premium cigars. And that includes an exemption from any rule that would bar the sale of premium cigars to 10 year olds. So the committee really needs to understand what the cigar industry is after here. And uh, I take issue with uh, Mr. Shavitz's assertion that the science uh, somehow supports carving out premium cigars as a distinct uh, group of tobacco products that are so fundamentally different than other cigars as to justify a complete exemption from regulation because the science doesn't support that at all as the panelists just described. Um, the fact is the science supports a number of basic propositions that support uh, continued FDA regulation of these cigars. We have seen that all cigars, including those claimed to be premium cigars, expose smokers to significant amounts of toxins and nicotine. A single cigar can contain more tobacco than a pack of cigarettes. As Mike uh, Cummings uh, referred to it, a premium cigar is like a log, a cigarette is like a twig. All cigars generate secondhand smoke that expose uh, bystanders to smoke that causes heart disease and lung cancer. And that has received uh, not enough attention in this meeting, quite frankly, and no response by the industry people. And contrary to industry claims, many cigar smokers do inhale the smoke, particularly if they are current or former cigarette smokers. And the past study shows that 30% of premium cigar smokers also smoke cigarettes. And even if cigar, cigar smokers don't inhale, as Mike Cummings pointed out, Cigar smoke, smoke exposes the mouth and throat to tobacco smoke, and that increases the risk of disease. There is a widespread misperception, particularly among youth, that, these, that cigars are less dangerous than cigarettes, and that can have dire public health consequences. And there's no question, as FDA has found repeatedly, significant numbers of smokers are exposed to the hazards of these premium cigars. The FDA estimated that over 120,000 adults smoke premium cigars every day. And that of course doesn't include the non-daily users who are exposed to these risks. In terms of youth usage of premium cigars, FDA, FDA estimated that tens of thousands of youth aged 12 to 17 are current users of premium cigars. And that doesn't include youth aged 18 to 20 who are now categorized as underage tobacco users by the new Federal Tobacco 21 law. And as we have seen, the tobacco industry does have a new strategy of trying to get premium cigars into convenience stores. Maybe it hasn't been successful yet, but that doesn't mean they won't keep trying, reinforced by marketing that associates these cigars with teen idols like Nick Jonas. I have a teenage daughter. I actually know who Nick Jonas is, and that's very clever <laughs> marketing directed at a youth market. And clearly there is no consensus definition of premium cigar. The cigar industry itself can't agree on a definition. So whatever differences the industry contends may between premium cigars and other cigars, whether they're made by artisans and enjoyed differently by smokers, there is no public health rationale, no public health rationale for carving out a category of cigars eligible for different regulatory treatment. And I think our panelists have supported that proposition uh, uh, quite adequately today. If I, if I could respond briefly, um, a couple of points. First, and, and, and I'm gonna say, we are not, this committee is not set up to talk about whether FDA should or should not regulate this product. What we're, to, what we're charged with is to, to uh, synthesize the available information and identify research gaps. Yes. So I'd, I'd like to confine the comments to the those kind of issues, uh, whether or not, you know, we're going to get into, I mean, the policy issues we all realize are critically important and the public health issues are, are, are important. But what we're trying to do here today is to get input on the work of the committee, not because we are in no position to, advo 
to advise. We've not been asked to advise uh, the FDA uh, or anyone else about what the regulatory stance should be. So, um, you know, I'd like to move us back in the remaining few moments to to the questions and particularly uh, to our panelists. Um, uh, and uh, I do I do appreciate their you know the uh, the, the issues and why people care passionately about them. Could I just make one comment in terms of a response to, um, sorry, we've got a little echo here. Uh, just to make a real quick response to the secondhand smoke issue. One of the reasons why I framed and discussed the usage of the retails and the lounges is because they are set up with an air replacement air, air filtration systems that are far beyond any sort of indoor spaces, leading to the fact that the Michigan recently Health and Human Services Department reopened cigar lounges in the midst of the pandemic because they found that the air circulation systems presented a cleaner environment for them to be in. And so therefore, when we're looking at where they are enjoyed and why, you're not having secondhand smoke for people that are, are abstractly just happen to be passing by into a, a vat of cigar smoke. These are people that are going for the express purpose to enjoy this in places where they have top of the line air quality fil filtration systems in there. And I would suggest that the, that the committee look into that because you, the more you can research about the clean air that's coming in, you can then get a much better sense of the, the aspects of the proposed risks that are involved with where, where people are smoking. Right. Of course, that's just one venue in which where people are are um, are smoking. Um, if, 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 Andrea, Andrea, are you raising your hand? Yeah. Yes, sorry, I can't raise my hand. With the you can put it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a question. I have a question, sort of, for everyone. Um, one of the things that we are trying to figure out is what who are the companies that are um, producing and selling cigars in the country and also thinking about who the re retailers are and where the lounges are. What, what's the denominator here? So I'm interested to know whether there are any lists that are currently available or what the data sources are where we could find that information. I'll be happy to submit as part of this a uh, list of our retail members so that you could kind of take a look and see where they're at and be happy to submit that for you so you know where all the retailers and lounges are. And we can do the same with respect to premium cigar manufacturers, but it, can you expand a little bit on exactly what it is you're looking for? The companies that are involved in the market and so we can understand sort of what the what the products are that are attached to the different companies, what the market share is, understanding really the, the market. Okay, that, that's helpful, thank you. Steve, I'll um, mention a couple comments from the Q&A box. Um, they're sort of, couple that are so, sort of related from um, Frank Herrera, New Media Law, and Alan Rubin, um, noting that some of the last panelists' um, presentations were completing non-premium with premium cigars. Um, also, um, this individual noted that acid cigars are not premium. Um, and then also, uh, similarly, just um, you know, presenting the data. So I do encourage everyone who presented today that any data that you do have um, to please, or references, to please go ahead and send those. Um, and also, you know, when you are presenting, um, sending in any additional data clarifying when you're speaking about cigars broadly versus premium or large cigars. And also note, just a reminder that any um, information that is um, shared with the committee will be part of our public access file. Yes, uh, and uh, the place to send them is to is to Amy at premium cigars at NNA, NAS edu. Steve, do I have time for one more comment, please? <laughs> yeah, br very briefly. I, I appreciate that. I, it's one point that I just really do not want to let pass. Um, it, Denny is, as, is a lawyer, as I am. He talked about the litigation and the argument that we're making to hold the agency to the law make the agency do what it's required to do. That is exactly right, which is exactly what Danny and, and his colleagues do when they go to court. At the same time, at the same time, in our submissions to FDA, we've laid out an argument for differential regulatory treatment for premium cigars. 
So yes, we're making an argument in court for exemption. We're making the agency prove its case. At the same time, we're making an argument to FDA in our court filings for differential regulatory treatment based on science, facts, and evidence. It's somewhat misleading to say that the industry is only asking for an exemption. Gotcha. Drew, uh, last, uh, I think you have the, the last word. Thank you, Dr. Twitch. I'll be very brief. Um, I think the, the panelists on this panel made a very compelling point for including price and any definition of premium, premium cigar. On our end, we've really struggled with that because while we know that premium cigars are sold at a higher price, trying to create an element that includes price seems very unworkable for a couple of reasons. First, um, retail prices vary by state due to state taxes. For instance, one of our Brickhouse Robusto cigars that may retail for $6.40 in Florida likely sells for $10 in California. And in tourist destinations like a Las Vegas casino, the price is even higher because of the markups. And so if you look at like a retail price, quickly a cigar might be eligible in one state in one setting and not eligible in another state, another setting. And then states also calculate their taxes differently. Some are on wholesale prices, some are on manufacturer's price. But the bottom line is, is that we as a manufacturer are the ones that have the responsibility to comply with FDA regulations in terms of labeling, in terms of SE and pre-market review and registration and, and, and having a definition turn on what a retailer that we don't control sells a cigar for and, and if they want to discount it or, or mark it way up and it, it affecting us as the one who's got to comply, it just makes price all but uh, unworkable. And so while, while price seems very attractive um, just from an enforceability and an administrability uh, aspect, it just doesn't seem uh, workable to us. All right, uh, so we're going to end here. And uh, thanks to all of our speakers uh, throughout the uh, the day, and uh, particularly to the to the last panel. Um, obviously, passionate issues surround this, and uh, the committee is going to go back and deliberate and uh, review the data. And uh, we'll look forward to getting our report out to everyone next year. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Have a good day. <laughs>